Hey, Marie. Right. Anyone? Can you hear me? Webex. Hey, Maurice, are you there? Hey, um, Michael, are you there? Sorry, my good morning. My uh, my uh, speaker setting was very low, so it was very low. No, I just want to see. I'm on twice just because I'm on my phone and. I'm actually okay. with the director, and so we're in the same room. I just want to make sure we're going to use headphones so that we don't interrupt each other, but I wanted just to make sure that you could hear me. Okay. Right. Obviously, you can. Yes, very well. Oh. Thank you. Okay. So all good. Thanks. Dane, can you hear me? Everyone? Great. Good morning. I'll turn my video off for now, Madam Chair, so no one sees me eat this sandwich. What is it? We need to know. Uh, Cleveland bagel, rosemary bagel. Oh, my favorite. You put rosemary on dirt and I'd order two. Yeah, me too. Honestly. Good morning. Good morning, Erica. Welcome to meeting two. Yeah.
people just wait one second. Is Marika on? I see um, the rest of commission members. Just want to give her a second. Uh, Madam Chair, it's my understanding that she will not be joining us this morning. Oh, she will not. Okay. Then we have a quorum and um, uh, it's nine o'clock. So I think we can go ahead, Michael. I'll defer to the director. Yes, let's go ahead and get started. Maurice, can you pull up the slide deck? Where is it? Yes, thank you so much. All right. I'll go ahead and read the preamble for this morning. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law and section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conduct its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raise hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raise hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raise hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. All in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter via our website and email has been considered. We've also received emails from those who have provided written comments on a particular matter. Thank you. All right, let's call the meeting uh, to order. And um, Michael, can you call the roll? Anthony. Present. Downing. Present. Luker. Present. Curry. Present. McCray Scott. Present. Shioiri Clark. Slife. Present. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, so we'll begin the meeting. Um, first item is to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, and first, I'll ask if there are any questions or comments or uh, anything we should consider to be. Um, edited in any way, um, and uh, if not, I will entertain a motion. I move approval of the minutes, Downing. Second, Fluker. A motion and a second. Can we call the roll, Michael? Anthony. Approve. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, motion carries. The uh, minutes from the previous meeting are approved. Uh, the first matter on the agenda is actually a zoning uh, map amendment, which is a public hearing. Um, so for this item and others, I'll read the, um, the rules for zoning matters uh, and, um, and we'll follow them as we proceed. So first we hear presentations from staff on the proposed uh, zoning changes. Uh, second, we'll hear sponsor testimony. This could be the council person, owner of the property, uh, where applicable. Um, and we will also take public comment since it's a public hearing. We'll allow testimony from those first proponents in favor of the zoning change, and then we will hear from opponents, those who are opposed to the zoning matter. We'll also allow for people, if they just have questions, uh, to, to also speak. Um, you must keep your statements to three minutes or less uh, so we can hear from everyone. And also, please remember to address the chair with your comments uh, on the specific zoning change. We'll ask that when you do speak that you state your name and your address if you're an affected property owner. Uh, so the first matter is an unnumbered ordinance uh, changing the use area and height district of parcels of land 
north and south of Lorraine Avenue between one West 150th and Norfolk Southern and extending the pedestrian retail overlay form over a district in that area. And I think the planner, Xavier Bay, will be presenting. Well, Thanks a lot. Good morning. Good Matt morning. Chair. Good morning, Commission. Uh, so we'll go to the next. Oh. Can I make a comment before Xavier starts? Um, I just wanted to note that um, the right. uh, geography is West 140th. And I, Xavier will probably note that as well during his um, presentation. It was simply a typo. Thank you. The, the, uh, sorry, that, that was actually a correction. Uh, it, it is actually up and down West 150th, but uh, <laughs> it is okay. I apologize. Sorry, no, yeah, that's okay. So yeah, so I introduce myself. Um, yeah, Xavier Bay, uh, City Planner, uh, City Planning Commission. And so yep, yeah, so uh, starting off, uh, like I was saying, we are looking at the areas of uh, parcels of land in between West 150th and the railroad, uh, changing the use area and height districts. Um, so some of the purposes uh, are to allow some some de potential development. Um, the RTAs parcels are being flipped for. Um, so also, you know, promoting different housing typologies, uh, removing some legacy industrial zoning, and just trying to really consolidate some of the hodgepodge zoning that's around this area. Um, I also have um, Adam Davenport, the neighborhood planner, um, to kind of chime in on some of the end of what I present here. Um, but feel free to jump in as you need to. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the Cleveland context. You can see uh, uh, just how the area where it's at in Cleveland on the west side there, Ward 17. <laughs> Next slide, please. And here's some of the uses that, that are that are going to be kind of changing. <clears throat> just to give you an idea, you know, just of, of sort of like what we're looking at here with with the, the within the zoning districts, some of the general uses. Um, I'll kind of refer back to this as I go along. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a map of what currently the area looks like zoned. Uh, not this whole entire area isn't being changed, but I just wanted to kind of show what the surrounding neighborhood uh, zoning looked like as well. And uh, next slide, please. And so <clears throat> on these maps, you're going to see uh, that the red labels are the current zoning, and then um, the shading uh, has kind of the legend there to show you what the zoning's uh, going to. And so <clears throat> starting off with this first area, it's a multifamily F1 zone. And so um, this, this one's, I'm sorry, multifamily E1, and this is going to a multifamily F2. And so mainly changing the, uh, the next gross floor area uh, from one half lot area to two times lot area and the uh, max height limit uh, from 35 feet to 60 feet. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is like an aerial, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Uh, this is an aerial just kind of showing uh, that the zoning district, uh, you can see the multifamily complex there, the residential uh, area up to the north there, and then just how it's bordered on the other, um, you know, eastern, western, and southern sides by retail. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some of the neighborhood context. Um, just kind of showing you, uh, you know, what, the, what the street looks like. Uh, next slide. So the next area is uh, pretty much right across the street there, across 147th Street, uh, going from local retail C1 to local retail uh, D2. And so, um, again, you know, uh, kind of going from uh, less I'm sorry, a more, um, yeah, so less lot area maximum of one half the lot area to one times the lot area, and uh, as well as changing that height district, so from 35 feet to 60 feet max. Uh, next slide, please. And so this kind of shows you the aerial again. Uh, you just kind of pointing out the area. Uh, as you can see, uh, Kind of some of the reasoning behind that is just so that the more of that space could be utilized um, for, for development. And so I do want to remind you, um, we are also uh, extending the PRO that's kind of coming uh, from the Western, like kind of 
eastbound up Lorraine up to 147th Street. And so, uh, so, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're looking at some of the context here. So pretty much from the right border of that zoning district uh, to the left or to the west, it's going to be uh, kind of we're implementing the PRO and then to the right there going right from 147th Street uh, west eastbound. Um, it's going to be where we're kind of implementing the urban form overlay. Next slide, please. And so here's some more of just kind of that neighborhood context. Uh, you, you can see like what's going on in the street. Um, and so a lot of the reasoning for that is, is to really kind of like make make a lot of this less auto centric. Uh, as you go on, you'll kind of see some of the uses around more of the area uh, don't really allow too much safe walkability. A safe pedestrian interaction with the street. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the uh, areas that are general retails, C2 and C1, and this is going to uh, change to limited retail uh, C2. Um, next slide, please. And so here's, here's some of the neighborhood context for uh, that, that zoning district right there in the corner of Warren and Lorraine. And then the next slide shows uh, kind of across the street there, um, across across the multifamily complex, the other GR uh, C1 zone. And so, you know, kind of, kind of upzoning the, the, um, uh, the height districts there, uh, height limitations. And so next slide, please. And so here you kind of see uh, some more of the neighborhood. Uh, th th this is this some more of the street views of, of those uh, general retail uh, zone districts. Next slide, please. And so here uh, is it's kind of like on the north end there on that northern yellow square. You see uh, just how that area has a bunch of different kind of kind of zoning districts going on from semi industry to uh, general retail and also general industry. And so um, a lot of these are going to th th that whole section is flipping over to limited retail business uh, G2. And so G, G uh, just reminding you the max gross floor area is three times the lot area and uh, the height district to 60 feet uh, maximum. And um, and so this is this is kind of like where that RT. Yep, you can go to the next slide. Sorry, <laughs> this is where that RTA um, uh, station is at. Actually, on the on the back end there of the lot, and then right up front to Lorraine, there's like a, kind of some auto sales going on. Um, so next slide, please. And so here's just kind of uh, you know just some of the pictures of the RTA parcels in the back. Uh, next slide, please. And here's uh, uh, some more of the um, space that, that's kind of tucked behind uh, a lot of the parcels that are fronting Lorraine and 150th Street. And so th this is kind of the only picture I could get kind of hopping over this fence. Uh, if you could see uh, West 150th Street there and just how the, the I guess you're kind of standing as if you're kind of walking. Uh, yeah, yeah, right where the um, eastern border of this zoning district is at. It's kind of like looking in there. And so th this area is also changing over to limited retail business G2. Uh, next slide, please. And so th these areas are um, currently general industry B3, uh, B being transitioned to semi industry G2. And so so a lot of these changes you saw are, are really kind of uh, get going um, a, a little more more restrictive, uh, just really kind of getting rid of a lot of that uh, industrial use, um, and and really trying to uh, make sure that the uses that do come in here in the future are are less auto centric and more. Um, it's, it's kind of a uh, better walking experience, a better. Uh, Kind of like pedestrian experience to keep more of their retail along, along the, the frontages there of Lorraine. Uh, you could go to the next slide. 
actually has some more aerials and uh, street views, uh, just kind of showing you some of these areas. And so, um, next slide, please. And so this is the street view right there, looking uh, southbound of, uh, or, so, yeah, the southern boundary of Lorraine. Um, so some of the current retail uses. And so this is the, this is also where we're implementing the, the UFO urban form overlay on both sides of Lorraine Avenue. Um, next slide, please. And so this is the other general industry B3 area that's being transitioned to semi-industry G2. Uh, this is along well, 150th there. Uh, next slide, please. And you can get a, a glimpse of some of those industrial uses as they stand. Uh, th these are all Google uh, Street View images that, that were dated uh, October uh, this year. Next slide, please. Those are live images. It's only sunny with green trees and more 17. <laughs> it's, it's so, um, so yeah, so here's just a reminder, you know, uh, implementing the, the PRO um, and UFO along Lorraine Avenue, uh, really kind of extending it um, fr from uh, the, the, the west. Uh, if, you, if you're going eastbound up Lorraine Avenue, you can, we're kind of extending the, the PRO and then kind of transitioning into the urban form overlay as you pass 147th Street, uh, continuing eastbound on Lorraine Avenue. Um, and yeah, like I said, really trying to to kind of like bring life back into some of the, the retail that's happening right there on the street. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and really moving away from those auto-centric uses, uh, really, really trying to help this area be be more pleasant to, to the, for the pedestrian. Um, or, or, and also the urban form overlay. Uh, yeah, like, like, kind of like what I was saying, you know, improving that walkability, um, you know, and then building a street uh, wall while still allowing some of that room for uh, for for that that facade uh, to to be to be more pleasant. And so, next slide. That that should be about it. Um, here's just you know, showing you again the area. Of the zoning districts that it's change, and I guess I'll also just kind of point out once again how you see on the left side of the map here that purple line is the existing PRO, and how it's transitioning. It. We're we're kind of extending it there uh, up to one forty seventh, and then transitioning to the extension of the urban form overlay, and that, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask um, maybe if the councilman would like to speak first, uh, Councilman Spire. Sir, sure, thank you, and thank you, Xavier. That was a a, a great summary. But just I'll I'll try to be brief because I know we have a, a lot of other stuff on the agenda. But um, kind of uh, this has been a couple of years in the making of of determining how we can kind of bring some new life to this stretch of Lorraine between the railroad tracks and and Warren Road. <laughs> Pardon me, I I'm, I a little hoarse. Um, the shopping plaza at 150th and Lorraine is now active and there's, there's a lot more people coming and going and we really want to build off of that energy. And then there's just a couple buildings there that, um, are, you know, vacant from an antiquated era and, and we're eager to have, uh, you know, the, this part of Lorraine, uh, be less auto centric as, as Xavier said, um, you know, the other big part of it, uh, kind of zooming back out, if you go around the entire city, you know, we have a lot of industrial along our railroads and, and I, that's really the legacy of, of why all these properties, especially the rapid are zoned for general industry. Um, one just practice and that was so that, you know, you could get a rail spur and then do rail served industry. Just one practically that's not feasible anymore because the rapid is between the site and the and the railroad. Uh, so you're not going to bring a freight train across the rapid tracks. Uh, but also, uh, you know, just with the uh, density of housing that that surrounds this area, you know, really having general industry is is not uh, aligning well with the surrounding land uses. Um, and as a layer onto that, that you know, I've been partnering with the administration to talk about transit oriented development. Uh, I, I very biasly think that this is one of the stronger TOD sites in the city with the rail and the bus lines coming in. And there are some parties who have expressed interest in, in starting to think through how to develop that site comprehensively. 
uh, to make it not just a big empty parking lot every day. And right now, general industry is is very restrictive and, and precludes a lot of that development from ever occurring. Um, so this is just a way for us to kind of pivot forward and think through how we can have kind of this little stretch of Lorraine uh, be a uh, area of strength in the neighborhood when right now it's just kind of something to pass through sometimes. Um, I think that's all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so first we're gonna take public comment from those who are in favor of the zoning chain. I ask that change, I'll ask that you just raise your hand, use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you in order. Um, so anybody who would like to speak in favor of the zoning change. I do not see any hands raised. Uh, anyone who is opposed to the zoning change or has a question about it uh, to staff? I also don't see any hands raised, so we'll close the public portion of the meeting and open it up to the commission members for any questions or comments. I think this will be a great uh, opportunity uh, for this area of Cleveland, and I would like to move approval. Downing. And I second McCray Scott. Uh, thank you both. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Michael, can you call the roll? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Blucher. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the staff for all the hard work. I know how much work it is to really look across such a length uh, and to do these kind of zoning changes proactively. Um, so thank you to the councilman too. It's just a really important stretch. And I was struck, I was just saying, I was struck by the potential just in terms of this stretch that I don't know as well as other parts of the city, but I think there is a tremendous amount of potential here. So thank you for this proactive uh, zoning change. Uh, next item is a conditional use permit. Um, and this is permanent parcel number 007 05 082. This is at 3929 Lorraine Avenue. Um, and Shannon, this also um, w requires public comment, correct? This conditional use is part of zoning from a public hearing point of view. Is that correct? Morning, Chair. Um, I actually got um, reached out to our law department regarding public comment and public notice as it relates to conditional uses. And public comment is not required, but if you would like to continue allowing public comment for conditional uses, um, he said that that would that would be fine. Okay, that would be my preference uh, to do so. Um, so we'll treat it in the same manner um, and have you go ahead first and uh, give the staff report on this first. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Shannon Leonard, Chief City Planner, City Planning Commission. Um, and so this is uh, a conditional use case and a pedestrian retail overlay. Uh, the current property here was a former uh, funeral home uh, that is located here on Lorraine. It's uh, currently zoned uh, local retail with the pedestrian retail overlay. Uh, next slide, please. And so the proposal here is to uh, it makes some improvements to the former funeral home and to uh, reuse it as an upscale retail establishment uh, for grooms and other uh, wedding parties for um, basically a place where groomsmen can go and uh, get fitted and get custom suits. Uh, and while they're getting fitted, they can also be enjoying uh, as a group, hopefully they'll be enjoying the other side of the space uh, where they'll have a bar, kind of like a speakeasy, uh, and it'll have an entertainment component. Um, additionally, the applicant wishes to potentially rent out some of this space for wedding parties um, if they just decide that they have a wonderful experience. Uh, additionally, upstairs, there's a retail office space as well as uh, one dwelling unit. Uh, next slide, please. And so under um, our zoning code, uh, anytime that you have a event space, as you're aware, uh, it is considered a place of assembly, which is also considered an institutional use uh, in the pedestrian retail overlay district. Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, one of the conditional uses that this project needs is that institutional use. So that's the specific use. And so you're just determining if this subject building space was designed specifically for this type of use proposed. Uh, 
if the denial of the application would result in long term vacancy of the subject property as demonstrated by the applicant, or if the proposed use is needed in the immediate area and suitable alternative locations are unavailable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, there is a uh, driveway um, and a small parking lot associated with this use. And so this particular applicant would like to continue to have that access uh, for one, the dwelling unit above. He believes his mother in law, or he may be staying in that that space as well as for deliveries for his retail establishment. Um, and he does intend, I believe, to gate the parking lot uh, to make it more um, pedestrian friendly. And he's been working intensely with OCI. Um, but you have to determine for those conditional uses for the off street parking within the 1st, 40 feet, as well as the driveway over the sidewalk. Uh, if the subject, um, the size of the subject property does not permit placement of parking, loading, or the driveway in a more suitable location, uh, it has been demonstrated by the applicant that the placement of the parking uh, would jeopardize the continued occupancy of the subject property. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in addition, so these are just some context photos. Um, you'll notice that this property uh, uh, is landlocked. Um, there used to be a large parking lot next door. It is now residential. Um, that first floor is parking. Uh, we did work with the applicant. You know, the preference would be to close this as we've done on other properties along the range, especially with um, the, the tight narrowness of the drive aisle um, and only being able to provide for four spaces. But we're also understanding of the fact that this is a landlocked parcel um, and that the applicant is still going to need um, 20 additional spaces uh, for the, that event use and the retail, as well as the um, retail office spaces, uh, on top of the fact that, um, yeah, so essentially he's going to need a variance, but he'll also need to make improvements to allow parking next to the residential uh, to the west. Uh, next slide, please. And so the last uh, conditional use that he will need is a building with an interior side yard of more than four feet. Uh, located within 40 feet of pedestrian retail frontage. And obviously, since this is a interior lot, uh, that drive aisle is considered uh, the side yard of this property. Uh, and so he'll need the conditional use for more than four feet. Uh, and just for clarification, uh, for our new folks, um, though these are existing conditions, because there are improvements being made to the property, um, generally they just have to go back through and get those conditional uses to bring, bring them compliant. If you determine that the applicant meets the criteria for those conditional uses. Next slide, please. And so again, the applicant will need uh, conditional use for off street parking or loading areas within that 1st, 40 feet. Uh, they'll need a driveway over the public sidewalk, the institutional use and in a building with an interior side yard more than 4 feet. Uh, they did have landmarks commission approval. They need to make some minor changes um, in terms of the front of the building, in terms of the facade design. Um, but I believe the applicant is here as well as um, Ohio City Inc. Uh, Nathan Lowell. Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, so first um, we're gonna hear from the sponsor if they would like to, or the applicant um, or, um, uh, and if you would like to speak, uh, can raise your hand. Um, if not, uh, oh, is that Zach? Okay, Zach, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, so, um, just wanted to break into a couple of reasons why I think this small but functional parking lot is really important. Um, first, as, um, as Shannon mentioned, my intent is for both my wife and I to live in the uh, the single unit that exists that that will exist um, in on the second floor of this building. Um, as a disabled veteran myself, um, I find it very difficult to consider having to park uh, a couple blocks away. You know, I think we all know what Cleveland winters can be, although it's been pretty mild so far this year. Um, so the idea of going grocery shopping or loading or unloading a vehicle for whatever reason and having to be a couple blocks away carrying those things or even a block away, um, it doesn't seem very feasible, uh, especially considering some of the things that I personally deal with are actually exacerbated in the winter months. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, and I, I think even more important to me, the long-term goal uh, for the charitable portion of this business um, 
is to assist other veterans who are transitioning out of the military or out of rehab facilities. Uh, I've always been very inspired but by what they've done, uh, what Edwins has done. And so the long-term goal for this is to try to do something in a similar vein where uh, hopefully this business will provide enough where Liz and I can move out of that unit at some point. I'm sorry, Liz is my wife. Um, and uh, the, the hope is that through the charitable portion of this business, um, we could actually house one to two of these veterans who are transitioning out of the service. Uh, the charitable portion of the business is, is essentially to um, get some, uh, take in secondhand suits, offering a discount for new purchases from folks. So doing suit drives and things of that nature, and then being able to bring those veterans in, um, do resume reviews, uh, things of that nature. But long-term to be able to employ some of these folks within the business itself and potentially house them. So again, just as I had mentioned the concern with um, parking a few blocks away myself, that concern becomes even larger when I'm talking about employing um, some veterans who are coming out of the service or dealing with their own disabilities um, or whatever it may be and asking them to potentially park a block, two blocks, whatever it is away and have to walk to their residence. Um, it, it, it just doesn't seem like a good setup um, for what we're trying to accomplish with that. Okay. Um, and, and lastly, you know, the, again, the long-term goal for this business, um, you know, we hope to have residents who are walking and uh, pedestrian access coming in to buy things. Um, you know, folks who are coming in for wedding suits, reasonably priced, priced wedding suits can, can park and walk in. But we, we also hope to target um, clients who are looking to do custom suits. And I think when you talk about custom suits and the price point that those types of things come with, being able to schedule an appointment and um, park in a parking lot and walk in, I think is for someone who's gonna be spending potentially that type of money is kind of an essential piece of the puzzle. Um, I, do I think there are people who might choose our business for their custom suit if, if they don't have that option? Perhaps. Um, but I, I worry that we would lose out clientele potentially if we don't have that. Um, I, I do have some other thoughts, but obviously we're on a, okay. on a time yeah. schedule here, so I will, I will end there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Are there any other, uh, anyone who would like to uh, make public comment? I see that Councilman uh, take his first. I, I could say, hey, hey Zach, uh, question for Shannon. Uh, could you go back to the, because it sounds like from what Zach was explaining that it's like a retail use. Can you explain the institutional part of it again? Like what component triggers institutional? Yep. Uh, can you go to the floor plan? There you go. Uh, yeah, so this is a ups, this is a different type of business that he's presenting. He's presenting basically this like all in one shop and play kind of uh, uh, store. So when his clients come in, while they're waiting for their groups to be fitted or whatever have you, they can also use uh, the uh, left or west side of the building as like a bar restaurant. They hope to have be able to have some type of live music in there. And so when you add the live music or the, or rental space for events or like small meetings or gatherings or any type of classes that he's offering veterans, whatever have you, it rises to the level of a building permit, which is an assembly use and that assembly use requires uh, becomes an institutional use in our zoning code. So it's not institutional as you would think of like a Cleveland clinic or an educational facility or classes, uh, but the assembly use under our um, under the PRO as it currently stands is considered institutional. Uh, and that's probably because when this was written, there's a lot of churches within our uh, neighborhood uh, shopping retail districts and churches are generally considered institutional and that churches also require an assembly permit. Uh, and so there's a little bit of convolution there that we're gonna probably work on uh, in the new year um, to kind of clarify this a little bit, because I honestly just do not think that like um, event spaces was really the intent of the assembly slash institutional use within a PRO, right? Um, but understanding that post pandemic that, uh, and in 2022, that that we have to rethink using our um, storefronts in historic shopping districts. Uh, and so this is where the institutional um, qualifying 
characteristic comes from here. Okay, thank you. Councilman, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's, 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 it's helpful. And just, it's, I mean, it seems like though the other uses in there are sort of like ancillary to the business and could be their own standalone business. Like you could, I'm seeing like golf, I see the word golf, like you could have a, like an indoor putt putt place. Would that be considered an assembly use or like, how, I guess, how does like duck pit bowling work? Is that considered an assembly space on 25th or? Yeah, it's considered entertainment. Uh, and so okay. any type of amusement, it's inter amusement slash entertainment. Uh, requires the assembly permit over in building and housing. And so it translates back into our zoning code as an institutional use. Um, and it really just, we haven't updated that section of our code to really um, more in line with the 2022 uses of that type of space, like indoor recreation. So when you're talking about, um, you know, playing pool or bowling or golf simulator, which is what is being offered here as well as in some other applications, um, that's all rises to the level of entertainment slash assembly. Uh, and so that's where we fall right now with the zoning code. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yep. Yeah, I'm, 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 right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so anyone a public we we'll take a quick public comment. Anybody uh, want to speak from the uh, from the audience in favor of this zoning change? You could just please raise your hand. Okay. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak who's opposed to this uh, conditional use? Um, okay, I don't see any hands, so we'll close the public portion um, and open it to the commission, commission members for any discussion or questions, additional yeah, questions. Sure. I, I'd mm -hmm. like to applaud the applicant for coming up with creative use. We need to be more innovative about how we we activate our storefronts along our, our major arteries. So I'm, Thank you. I, I believe that's, it's it's an awesome use. Thank you. I agree. Um, I see uh, Commission Member Anthony uh, has her hand raised. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick question, Shannon. Or, or can we go back to the slide uh, where it shows the funeral home and then the adjacent uh, residential building, please? Sorry, I'm switching my screens. Um, so I did have just one question about the parking. Um, it's hard to see from this view of the picture. Uh, so the residential that faces Lorraine, it looks like there's another structure that may be behind that. And I was just wondering, thank you. Um, I guess, how far back are you, are, are they proposing, the applicant proposing the parking will go? And will that interfere, I guess, with flow of exiting a building, which I can't quite tell if there's a, a exit on that side uh, where the carpool is right now um, for those two adjacent residential buildings. Yeah, good morning. So the pr uh, proposal here is for four spaces. There's three parallel along that building. So there's right now there's currently a chain link, link fence. That bottom, uh, the first floor of the building next door uh, to the west is um, actually a parking garage. Um, hmm. But so generally speaking, when you have uh, even just a residential, whether there's a parking garage there or not, um, the zoning code is going to require a six foot board on board fence. Uh, and so there'll be three parking spaces along uh, that that building and there will be one in the rear of this uh, the funeral home itself. Um, you can't really see from here, but there's a little spot for parking. Uh, there in the rear for like what was used probably previously as like drop offs and such. Uh, and previously, actually, this was where the housing is on this corner uh, was actually just an open parking lot. Um, and so when they did the, if you go back to the parcel map, uh, Maurice, you can see that this um, parcel kind of jogs a little bit. Uh, right. yeah, and here's the site plan. So um, you can see where the four, the three parallel spaces along the building on West 47th is. Uh, and then the one in the rear, um, and then they're closing the curb cut down to the required amount for um, uh, parallel zero degree parking. Uh, so it'll be an in and out. It's a really, really tight drive for the parking. Um, but, you know, understanding that also understanding if you go back to the next slide, that there is really no way for the applicant to enter this parking lot out because of the way that this parcel was subdivided. Um, because of the properties in the rear, there's a daycare on the south here, um, but there's no way to uh, bring, extend that road uh, into this parking lot or that alley, that very small 
uh, alley into this parking lot. We kind of walk through the different scenarios with um, Ohio City uh, and landmarks, um, and they really just couldn't find a better solution um, if they were going to keep this parking lot. So Thank you. That helps. It does. Thank you so much, Shannon. Sure. Thank you. Any other um, questions or comments from commission members? Madam mm -hmm. Chair, sure. I'd like to move to approve the conditional use um, permit as, as described herein. And I'll second Downing. Oh, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Can we call the roll, Michael? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Councilman. I said yes. Right, thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the applicant. Um, and thank you, Shannon. Always so thorough. Um, lot splits and consolidations. Um, the next item is permanent parcel number 002-012-029 and 056. This is at 4501 and 24511 Clinton Avenue. Um, the project sponsor is Mary Elliott. Are you here to speak to this matter? I am. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Um, um, City Planning Commission. Uh, I am here today to request a change of the plat for the property that is actually um, around the corner from the named. Uh, they're both uh, impacted, 4501 through 11 Clinton, as well as 1448 West 45th Street, of which this is the primary reason for this um, plat consolidation and split. Um, the property at 1448, um, Michael, could you go to the next slide, please? The purpose of the change is for this particular address, uh, which fronts West 45th Street. Um, presently, without the, these changes, it exists with a six foot rear lot. My intention ultimately is to uh, kind of minimize the townhouses on Clinton. Um, I have a sizable 50 foot lot to the immediate west of the Clinton frontage. And this will allow for this property at 1448 West 45th Street to have rear footage. Uh, as you can see, there's no frontage um, for a yard. Please, next slide. So you can see I'm very close to the uh, West 45th Street on ramp at Detroit and West uh, 45th Street. And so two blocks south of that is where this property is located. That gives you again the site location. So these are the Clinton townhomes. I've owned those places for a long time, since 1994. Uh, my late husband and I have renovated them at that time. Uh, they're actively occupied, and um, it was always our intention from the time we took title to turn this site into condominium housing to increase home ownership. Um, as well as the 1448 Street property, which will at some point soon, hopefully, um, be sold. And um, the site improvements will help enhance home ownership opportunities, changing it from five rental units, one single family at 1448, and four units on the corner to all owner occupied. Next, please. And you can see how they're adjacent. You see the fence that fronts uh, West 45th Street is actually part of the uh, Clinton parcel. Next, please. And this gives you the general intersection. You can see the water tower there right th uh, across from uh, Garrett Morgan High School. Next, please. And again, this is a frontage uh, with the gas company's uh, fencing around the tree. Next, please. This is the vine court um, viewpoint. Next, please. So um, the plat, which was done by Dave Bruckner, who was uh, formerly employed by um, Capital Projects of the City of Cleveland for a very long time, and did the previous plat 
you see at the very bottom to the right, it identifies a former um, plot uh, change, which included the Western parcel to the terrace property. That was done in 04 before I owned 1448 West 45th Street. Uh, it identifies that the North property line is at an angle presently, and that will be squared off to allow for privacy fencing without having to go around trees. Likewise, the northern portion of this parcel is effectively landlocked. There's no um, access from the, the dwelling. Um, it's the north face of the garage. Next, please. There's a close up of the parcel change. Next, please. So this is the present configuration. Next, please. And this is the proposed configuration. Next, please. So again, you see this is the enhanced, or this is the current version of the north pars of the pars north end of the parcel. And the next slide will show the changed version. So effectively, again, I'm looking to square it off, make it um, a right angle and to avoid having to go around trees for uh, the privacy fence. Next, please. This is the most critical portion of why I need to do this. There is no rear yard. Uh, effectively, there is no yard if I don't do this. Um, the tree that you see at the very end by the chain link is going to be removed in my process for redevelopment as well. It is way too close to the structure. Next, please. And this is the proposed change. You can actually see the pink stake still exists on Vine Court. Next, please. So the highlighted uh, orange is where the new fencing would uh, be fronting West 45th Street. It isn't changing the depth or height uh, of the existing fence. Next, please. And this is the rear proposed fence line. And it will, again, um, encompass the tree that you see uh, a break in the fence that will be on the inside of this lot. Next, please. And again, allowing for an enhanced use um, of the yard for the um, owner, future owner of the property. Next, please. Um, one of the reasons I'm not uh, trying to make it any larger than this is that I do intend to uh, kind of minimize the Clinton parcel, and this shows the intended use of uh, location of parking for that use off of Vine Court. Um, there is presently a gate there, um, but uh, there needs to be added parking to allow for a maneuvering area. Um, those parking places would be covered with um, it would basically be um, uh, the open carport style um, for the for the vehicles that um, are part of this development. Thank you. I believe that. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, you. Commission members, any questions uh, for this round? Of, and thank you for the very thorough presentation. I, oh, Madam Chair, to the applicant, I, I, I appreciate how you delineate delineated everything is very clear. This is an exemplary example of how I think things should be done. When Thank you very much. I, I did get a little help from my brother. <laughs> <laughs> is that a motion there, Commissioner Member? Yes, I would like to move to approve um, the, the lot split as presented. And I'll, I'll second. Oh, we have a motion and a second. Can we call the roll, Michael? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. McRae Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, motion carries. And thank you. It's nice to see uh, more opportunities for home ownership. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a good holiday. Thank you too. Um, all right. We're heading into the design review cases. Uh, and the first matter, uh, if we go forward, is the Euclid Corridor. 
Uh, this is uh, Kalina House, new construction. This is for schematic approval. And as I'm reading this to my commission members, please uh, take a look at the committee recommendations as it was approved with conditions. This is at 2041-2055 East 79th Street. And the project representatives, I see Greg Ernst, uh, Matt Kalina and anyone else who would like to speak to this matter, I'm going to swear you in. Note that we saw this in June of 2021, so that was a little while ago for conceptual approval. Um, so anyone who's going to speak, um, please raise your hand and uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? I do. I do. Okay. Um, so, uh, we'll hear your presentation first and then we'll hear from staff or any other, um, comments about the, um, design review, uh, yesterday. Go ahead. Great. I'll, I'll kick us off. Uh, good morning, planning commission. My name is Matt Kalina, uh, representative of the Mark Kalina junior foundation, which is a local 501 C three nonprofit that focuses on supporting uh, victims of traumatic injury, return to a new normal life after injury. The project that we're putting in front of you today for schematic approval is the Kalina House, which is intended to be a transitional housing facility when folks uh, have a traumatic injury or a family member is using the great medical institutions of Northeastern Ohio, uh, gives them a place to stay. Oftentimes when folks have a traumatic injury that impacts their mobility, um, a lot of times their home environment isn't the most conducive environment for them to have the type of recovery that allows them to lead an independent life uh, shortly after uh, experiencing a traumatic event. And the goal of this um, housing project that we're going to share with you today is to be a place for us to create a sense of community, connect them with social services, um, and also bring some development to the, the Fairfax neighborhood along the RTA um, Healthline bus route uh, to provide transportation and access to the medical facilities in Northeastern Ohio. So thank you so much for your time today. I'll, I'll pass it over to Greg. Yeah, thanks, Matt. My name is Greg Ernst. I'm with AODK Architecture. Um, as Matt alluded to, this is right in the heart of everything. It's a, really a connection point between um, all the hospitals in the area and also is very close to a uh, bus line, the health line. So. Uh, great location. This is on the East 79th Street. Uh, you can see Carnegie uh, on the south side there. We go to the next slide. It's a little bit closer up view of the four lots that we are proposing to combine um, to be able to put the project, the building on there. So on the left hand side is, uh, like I mentioned, East 79th. Um, and the white uh, outline there uh, denotes where we will be placing the building. If you go to the next slide, please. Here's some photos um, across the street and on the property itself. There are abandoned lots um, around this area. And so developing this era, uh, property is um, very beneficial to this area. Across the street used to be an apartment building. There's a church up the way. And, and again, a lot of grassy lots uh, around this area. So next slide, please. Uh, this shows how we plan on uh, laying out the property um, to the north is the building itself. It's a 15,000 square foot single story building. It does have a courtyard in the middle. Um, it has a setback corner just um, denoting where the entrance is, which is essentially right in the middle. And then we have 19 parking spaces to the south. Uh, there is a dumpster on the southeast corner connecting sidewalk to the main sidewalk on East 79th. And um, we, we are in agreement with the comments made by uh, Euclid Corridor yesterday. And so we will be making those changes for the final uh, at our next planning commission meeting. Next slide, please. These are the elevations. Um, we're looking at doing a mixture of EFIS up high, uh, face brick down low and metal uh, roof siding. Um, I'm sorry, uh, metal standing seam roofing. Um, the main elevation has a good amount of glass on it um, just to connect the people uh, from the inside to the outside. And like I mentioned, there's a the kind of that cloistered um, courtyard in the middle. And then around the other two 
facades, the north and the east elevation. There were comments yesterday that we're going to look at the gable end and we're going to look at some of that punched opening just to kind of dress that up a little bit. Next slide, please. This shows some perspective renderings. Um, the corner, the main corner of the facility on the upper left, showing how the sidewalk comes off E 79th into the parking area. Um, and just to kind of break down of forms towards the corner to enhance the corner. Um, and you can see on the upper right hand corner is uh, again, just a lot of glass. The entrance is off to the right there. Bottom left hand corner rendering shows the entrance to the left. So you see the doors are open. Then we've got a small fountain with a niche where it says the Kalina house, some areas for seating outside. And then again, that courtyard um, on the bottom right hand side, just to allow people to get outside um, and still be, you know, in a uh, part of the facility and uh, breathe some fresh air. So, next slide, please. Uh, this is a uh, plant list and, and lighting schedule, um, which we can get into detail if you wish. Next slide. This slide just shows the plantings they were planning on putting in and the light pole and, and lighting that we were planning on doing. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, commission members, um, any questions or comments? And I, once again, can you go back, Maurice, to the, um, the conditions uh, on this? Um, and I'm going to kind of ask this to the design, to the staff um, who who were part of the design review here. Is that um, if committee members are okay? This is for um, conception, or sorry, this for schematic design approval. But if they're to really meet all these changes and come back to design review and staff, um, if the commission members feel comfortable about. Um, this actually coming back to staff for final approval as opposed to back here, but I'll leave it up to the commission members. Um, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Madam chair, it, it would help me immensely if I could see how this building sits within its context. Is there, is there a site plan that's superimposed over an aerial that kind of gives me an idea how things are situated? I, I could speak to that. There, there isn't in the package. I mean, we showed the property over the aerial, but we didn't put the building in it. But East 79th running north south uh, on the west side there, the building parking lot is essentially on the south property line. So if you go to the, the third slide, it shows the close up of the building plan itself, and that's essentially how it's it's located. Oh, I'm go sorry, back. the fourth okay. slide. So. Yeah. I can explain some of the buildings that are around it if you'd like that context. Could you do that? That would, I think yeah. that would help. In the bottom left of this image is Angie's Soul Food Cafe. Across directly to the left across the street of East 79th is a vacant apartment building that's four stories high. And then in the top left corner of this is a church. Uh, directly above the lot is a CVS pharmacy. And then directly below the lot is the new, I believe it's Bank of America or U.S. Bank. Yeah, that that helps. Thank you. I, I was trying to get the proper context. Yeah, and, and for context on why the site selection was, is, is we're trying to create something that promotes the independence of these folks after they leave the medical institution, being nearby a pharmacy, nearby a, a place of faith, food, and also financial services were things that we thought would be attractive to encouraging the independence of the folks that are living here as they adapt to their new ability. Yeah, no, I, I understand me because you have Duncan, you have Cleveland Bagel. So there's this is nicely, I think it's nicely situated. Is this a is this a four percent what is this a tax credit deal or OFA, low income? What what's driving the financing? We're, we're currently working through the capital stack that we're going to be working with, but there has been discussion around uh, opportunity zone tax credits. And we also spoke with um, some members on, on how we could potentially get tax credits for job creation and what we're trying to use for the space. But um, we do have some commitments for financing from a couple of, of private uh, folks and also uh, donations and contributions from the 501c3 nonprofit that is supporting the development. Thank, thank you. If I could interject too, um, real quick, Matt, the, uh, the, 
the stay time, I think you had mentioned it yesterday morning, was it's about 60 to 90 days. Is that correct? Yeah, we're estimating between 30 and 90 days is what most folks would, would likely use the facility for. So it's not necessarily long term. Thank you. Any other <clears throat> questions or comments from commission members? Yeah, I have a question. Um, are you open to um, incorporating the comments from design review? Yes, we are. We have no issues with those comments and we will incorporate them. Okay. Then I move approval uh, incorporating the comments from design review. And I second. Oh, we have a motion and a second. Um, I'm going to ask this just because as as I've been trying to, you know, make the commission more efficient. So to um, commission member Downing, um, and I think the director is okay with this, um, is the idea of actually giving them uh, final approval, but to come back to staff with the changes so that they don't have to come back here again since um, they um, they have already been here twice. Yes, so you, I, will, okay with that? I will revise my motion, Madam Chair, to move approval, move for final approval, incorporating the comments from design review uh, for staff review. Are you okay with that, Commission Member McCray Scott? Yes, I am. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Motion and a second. Let's call the roll. Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Euclid Corridor. Um, this is the Cole Eye Institute seeking final approval 2022 uh, East 105th Street. Um, we have representatives here from the Cleveland Clinic, uh, from Bostwick Design, um, and HGA. Um, we actually saw this on September 2nd. Uh, where we did schematic approval so that it had conditions at that time. So we'll ask that um, the team address those uh, directly as they present. Um, and uh, I need to swear everybody in at once. So do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer to the penalty of perjury? I do. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, please go ahead and... Uh, uh, move forward with the presentation and please also just address the items from local. Thank you. And, uh, and as, as you mentioned, we did, uh, present to the Euclid corridor design district. Um, we were asked, uh, to clarify four things four conditional things, and we wanted to postpone our presentation to city planning commission until we could quickly address those four issues. So thank you for allowing us to postpone this meeting until today. Uh, we will address those issues, but as, uh, as was mentioned, we are seeking final approval. So we have some elaboration and uh, finalization of the design that we presented to the commission earlier in uh, the beginning of September. So with that, I'll let my uh, partner, Brian Wall, uh, continue with our presentation. So thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, today, what we'll do is we'll go through um, the site just to remind everybody where the location of the uh, building's going. We'll review the site plan. We'll go through the landscape plan. We'll quickly breeze through the floor plans because I know that's not as important as the exterior that we have here at the end. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So if everybody remembers, this, this is the Cleveland Clinic campus. The Coli expansion is where the red star is there uh, highlighted on the on the screen. It's south of the existing building. Next, please. Uh, zooming in a little closer to the our site itself, we are uh, we are surrounded by the existing Coli, the Cryo building to the west, and the Tassie Cancer Center to the south. Uh, we're on the corner, uh, close to the corner of East 105th Street and Euclid. Uh, they're highlighted in the red box. So again, we're just south of the existing uh, Coal Eye Center. Next, please. And then you can see here, I'll turn it over to Chris here in a second. You can see where the new addition is and how we fit into the overall 
uh, landscape plan. And, and Chris, if you're, I think you're on the, the call, if you could uh, take it away and go from, go from this point. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, Chris Meske with Boulevard Studios. And um, if you want to advance the slide, we will um, show you a few critical areas working kind of um, clockwise from the intersection of Euclid and East 105th, wrapping around uh, back to the uh, northwest uh, corner of the property. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, so we have a few key areas, as I mentioned, and uh, we've, I think we've gone over these, but uh, we will go, we will go through them pretty quickly. Next slide. Um, we were, we were asked uh, by uh, the, the design committee to uh, study this corner a little bit further which we did, and this is what we presented yesterday. Um, our goal of this corner is to really kind of finish off the intersection so that it is, um, a, you know, kind of a completion to match, um, you know, what's going on at the other three corners there. Obviously we have the Ronald McDonald house with um, the uh, Hector Vega uh, tulips and, and then the other two corners, Mount Sinai and Walker Center. So, um, you know, part of this will be you, some of the goals here was really kind of giving back the streetscape to the community, making our access points into the building uh, very easy, but then also providing uh, something, you know, just at the streetscape level that, um, you know, is very useful, but very just open to the community. So what we're proposing is kind of a um, curved plaza area, um, some public art and a seat wall. Next slide. And um, we have some gray pavers at uh, proposed at the building. So what we're proposing here is a uh, a very durable paver that is you know an appropriate size and shape for the streetscape setting. It's um, definitely reflects what's going on in the crosswalks and what's going on at those opposite corners, but it's still in this uh, shade of gray that's really going to kind of uh, reflect back what's going on and what we're proposing at the building. Uh, we're also proposing a uh, concrete seat wall here. We actually have some grade. Um, it, it, the topography rises as you uh, approach kind of the, the center point there. So it's really kind of an opportunity to uh, hold that back a little bit, create this plaza area, but then also add some seating. And then we are vetting a uh, public art piece uh, with uh, the clinic. And oh, finally, we do have an existing interpretive sign there that we um, plan to keep, and it's going to be very accessible and, and visible from, um, you know, all those vantage points. And um, and then we'll we'll add in uh, some low landscape material that um, you know very hardy but good color uh, throughout the growing season. Next. And in response to uh, the uh, the conditions that we when we met with the Euclid uh, Planning Commission, we wanted to show them what this corner would really look like, not just in plan, but how how the corner responds to the building and how the building is the backdrop for the for this corner. So you can see here, standing on Euclid and 105th Street, the public art is uh, masked in the front. There we haven't we haven't gone down the path of what that is yet. You see the interpretive sign on the on the right, and then the the seat wall along the along the middle there with the the plantings that Chris was mentioning. Next, please. Uh, we have a a, a pretty significant uh, drop off sequence, um, so the loop is very important in terms of um, you know wayfinding and again we. You know, the, the assumption is that we're dropping off folks with, uh, you know, diminished vision. So it's very important for us to provide paving and landscaping that's very indicative of where those entry points to the building are. Uh, we're proposing, um, you know, some paver materials that will really kind of point out where the entry point is very welcoming and but also very traversable um 
and then a, a series of benches, you know, it's, it's going to come up that people will probably be, you know, waiting at, at some point. And this is also a, a, a discharge area. So, um, comfortable seating and then, um, a few bike racks because some staff will, um, arrive by bike. Uh, we've, we're also showing some connection points. We have a transit uh, waiting area on East 105th Street. We are providing uh, very good access to and from. A few grading issues, but um, it should be very accessible from the street. Next slide, please. We have a, uh, a an overhang area and a, a pretty steep slope, so we're just proposing some very low material that will spread, but not be invasive, um, provide some good color and texture, but um, remain very low maintenance. Next slide. This is a west entry. It's going to reflect quite a bit of what we're doing on the east entry, um, but it's also seen as an opportunity of creating a small garden space. We're proposing kind of a sensory garden. This is, um, again, we are dealing with people with diminished vision, so a place where they can come out and and smell and hear and, and feel and, and just really kind of enjoy um, this, this space. Again, with the same seating, and we also have the Gordon Gunn sculpture that will be relocated here. It's going to be very visible from the roadway and from the pathways through the garden space. Next slide, please. At this intersection, again, we are addressing the streetscape. Um, we also have some existing um, large overgrown evergreen trees that kind of pass their useful life. So we're using this as an opportunity to extend um, a, a cor the corridor of, um, of um, tr <laughs> trees, and I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> um, of sycamore trees along here so we're going to replace those and then we have some existing wayfinding signage we will um, update that with some new landscaping and again address the corner similarly to what we have at uh, that intersection there last slide finally at the loading dock the loading dock um, is existing but it's being expanded uh, we are bringing in some new plant material especially with the removal of those evergreen trees on euclid um, so we're going to bring in some new evergreens with um, a cl little closer to it but then also kind of arrange them in a, in a uh, align them more in, in line with the uh, the existing landscape uh, geometry that's uh, existing on the campus So as we get into the uh, site lighting, it's, a, it's really important to make sure that we make it uh, a very transparent space, bring people into the into the area here. And we're, we're thinking very hard about where we place uh, the site lighting. So you can see here we're using uh, bollards to highlight a lot of the pedestrian paths around the uh, new addition itself. You can see where there's existing uh, street lights and where we're adding new street lights as well as um, you know the, the clinic is very uh, consistent across their campus using the, the pencil lighting what we call the pencil lighting uh, throughout the campus to make it consistent across the entire um, organization's uh, campus next please signage is also another key component uh, of our building and, and making sure people get to the place that they need to go to so we're having a new building mounted signage on the east side where you see the uh, dot there in uh, blue. You can see where there's existing signage, uh, which is also important to make sure people find the right, the right place. And then the added site uh, monument signs that we're putting at either uh, end of the new drive that's on the south side of our, our new addition. Next, please. Uh, I, I just quickly want to go through these. Can you go to the next, please? Just briefly on this one, uh, the east side is where 105th is. We're using, um, we're having an atrium in between the existing and the addition to help uh, blend the two together. That's that's the big uh, the big point here. Our entry is in that uh, east and west end of the atrium. 
If you could click through the next couple slides, that would be great. Keep going. Just an idea of what we're doing on all the floors, which I showed last time. Next, please. One more. The way the new the new addition relates to the existing building, you can see here. Um, just a quick uh, building section. Next, please. And then we'll get into the uh, exterior now, and I'll turn it over to Bryce. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Bryce Hubert's HGA. Uh, this is the east facade. This illustrates uh, very clearly what was shown uh, by Brian in the planning. Uh, on the right side of the page, page right, which is the north, that is the existing Coli Institute. Uh, the new addition is the much more quiet and respectful box uh, on page left. This has a similar massing as Kryl and Tausig uh, that create the edges of Kryl ball. Uh, in between that atrium piece that was mentioned earlier, is not only the element that uh, separates the new addition from the existing building, but also unifies all the program within. And this is the point that uh, the patients and staff will enter the building at the ground floor. Uh, in the new addition, there's a large overhang that will accommodate uh, pick up and drop off uh, for patients uh, in inclement weather. And the biggest expression are these three uh, elements of fenestration. Uh, one per uh, each elevated floor plan. And that relates uh, very similarly to, or echoes the language of Tausig on the south side of Crown. Next, please. The south facade, this is immediately north of Cryo Mall. This creates that northern edge. Uh, we are including as much glazing as possible. Again, echoing uh, our neighbor to the south of Tausig. Uh, but a little different detail where we have a frame that's really highlighting the program within and creating as much uh, visibility and daylight for the occupants within the building. The ground floor is recessed uh, beyond the edge of the building to really protect itself uh, from daylight, direct daylight. Here we are using clear glass on the ground floor and in the atrium, but the upper levels two, three, and four, as shown within the picture frame, is uh, high-performing glass uh, to accommodate uh, uh, the solar uh, orientation. Next, please. The west facade is uh, very similar to the east facade. It's symmetrical. Uh, we have the three ribbon windows uh, on two, three, and four. And this also shows the expansion of the loading dock uh, and how we are visually protecting it from the outside world. Next, please. My favorite facade, the north facade, the new addition, although it's a larger mass, is really uh, subdued and almost obscured by the existing building and becomes a much more uh, special element to the internal campus of Cleveland Clinic. But from the external community, it is a much more reduced mass. Next slide, please. Here is a more polished uh, rendering of that experience from the corner of 105th and Euclid. And this really illustrates the language of that street facade and how the massing and fenestration relates to the existing buildings of campus and the surrounding area and how it frames and really creates a wonderful moment for Cryo Mall within. Next, please. Uh, this is our main drop off. This was one of the comments uh, from the Euclid corridor yesterday. Uh, there was uh, an interest to really emphasize the main entry and we are accommodating that by including a much more tactile and warm material. The underside of this canopy uh, will be a wood product uh, to really become a more welcoming and inviting experience for the patients, leading you into that wonderfully glassy, transparent atrium beyond. Next, please.
This is a view from Cryo Mall looking north, seeing that uh, south facade. And this rendering really uh, helps to illustrate the differences of glazing types, the high performing glass on two, three, and four, versus the more transparent, welcoming uh, glazing on the ground floor underneath the overhang that is created by the uh, massing. Next, please. This is an illustration of the different material types uh, that have been mentioned uh, throughout this presentation, as shown on the right. Uh, we are proposing a limestone, a complementary material to the existing pink Stony Creek granite that is found throughout campus. Uh, there are pieces of white, black, and gray speckles throughout that create that pink tone. Um, and that limestone uh, really helps to uh, complement and enhance those elements of the existing stone. One of the comments from the Euclid Corridor, because our meetings are virtual, uh, we held an in-person session for those that were available to really touch and feel and get up close and personal with these materials. Uh, and that meeting went very, very well. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we're prepared for any questions or clarifications you might have. Thank you. Okay. So of these uh, four, four comments, um, you are addressing all of them? Yes, we have addressed all of them. And we the, the imagery that we showed you today, we showed yesterday at the Euclid Planning um, okay. Committee, and they were they were very happy with the with the updates that we made. Okay. Um, all right, commission members, any questions, comments? Um, okay, so this was uh, for final approval. It was approved with conditions. They've met the conditions um, here. So any motions? I'll move approval. Uh, and I second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Michael, can you call the roll? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Blucher. Yes. Curry. <clears throat> yeah. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, we will look forward to the construction shortly. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very the, much. Thank you. Uh, for the next two items on the agenda, I'm going to um, actually, and including the administrative approvals, if, if Commission Member Fluker doesn't mind, just because I need to actually leave the meeting because I'll recuse myself and actually exit the Zoom. If he could take the the um, the remainder of the meeting, and I, I know. Um, there might be a second or two that he has to jump off. So just in case, um, I, I do not believe this meeting will go past 11, but if um, a commission member downing, just in case, um, I just wanna alert her that there might be a second or two that she's needed. But uh, with this, I'm gonna recuse myself and leave the meeting for the remainder of this meeting and turn it over to the vice chair, uh, commission member Fluker. So thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Oh, wait. Um, Hold on. Yep, I'm leaving. All right, thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> See you. Final answer? Okay. Yes, final answer. I <laughs> Bye. Um, thank you. Vice Please Chair you. Fluker, um, I, I do need to leave at 11.15, so anyway. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. let's see if we can expedite some of these things. Sounds good. We don't want to lose a quorum. Um, next. Agenda item is proposed demolition and Euclid Corridor Design Review Case um, 36. Do we have anyone from staff or is there another applicant presenting this one? Yes, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Fluker. This is Roseanne Potter, Senior Vice President and CFO of the Cleveland Foundation. I'm here today with uh, representatives from VOCON and also um, 
uh, representatives from Merit Chase, but it's our understanding that item number um, 031 as well, um, which is for the final uh, design review, which I think may be just a little bit on a couple of other further pages um, that, you know, was our intent to get the two final motions here today, uh, vice chair, if that's okay with you. Sure, Ms. Potter, I think that's a, that's appropriate. You can present both of these, um, contiguously and, um, I just want to be transparent. I have to abstain. That doesn't mean I can't participate in the proceedings. So, um, uh, please proceed. Wonderful. Well, I just want to say thank you for having us here today. Um, we appreciated the feedback that we'd gotten the last time from the design committee. Uh, we've incorporated a lot of those requests. I am very excited here to present the final design of the Midtown Collaboration Center. We also have one of our anchor tenants, um, Jumpstart, Ray Leach here, is also on the line. But uh, just wanted to tell you we're very excited about the project and we're very um, honored to be here today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura Reese from uh, VOCON. Before we get started, since, sure. since we're presenting both, I'd like to swear everyone in sure. presenting the design portion of this so that we don't have to interrupt you. Yes. Um, and just please identify by stating your name after Was I it? state this. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth for this matter now in hearing under the penalty of perjury? Roseanne Potter, yes. Laura Reese, yes. Nicholas Family, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. And to the applicant, if you could sort of stick to the, the things that um, have materially changed based on comments previously would be a great help. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to VOCON now. Thank you, Roseanne. And thank you all for having us here this morning at the Planning Commission. Um, we are very excited, as Roseanne indicated, to bring before you um, an update on the, the, the Midtown Collaboration Center and to request approval to demolish the Stern Building, which is necessary because it is within the footprint of our new building. So we're gonna be presenting that information here shortly. Nick Family is our design director here today and he will be representing us as he makes the presentation for VOCON and Merritt Chase is here as well. And Chris Merritt is our, our landscape architect who will be presenting the information. Merritt Chase is doing a substantial amount of landscaping work within the district for the, the, um, the, the entire Midtown district, mostly for the Cleveland Foundation, but also working for Dunham Tavern and doing their campus. So things that they're doing in the area are very exciting. Um, as it, Roseanne indicated, today we are seeking final approval for the, the uh, Midtown Collaboration Center and for the demolition of the Stern Building. Um, the Stern Building occupies the uh, lot that's about midway through this, the uh, E66 Street, and we will show you more of that in just a moment. Since our last meeting with you where we made our presentation, there, we have been very busy working with a lot of different entities to make sure that we do incorporate the comments that were made at the meeting, both from the design review meeting and from the planning commission. And so we've been working with Pat Bot to talk about our site development. We've talked with city architecture about the design of E66, and we're trying to collaborate with them to coordinate our work with theirs. And we've also received zoning approval for the project. So we've been busy working with the city to make good progress on the project. So with that, I will turn it over to Nick to do the uh, design presentation. Great, thank you, Laura. And thank you uh, to the committee for having us today. I'll, I'll try and make this quick. I, I hear um, some time constraints. So uh, we'll jump right in. The Stern Building, uh, mid block between Chester and Euclid on 66. Um, you can see the location plan. If you just go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, we, we took some contextual photos, uh, sorry, uh, history, uh, historic, uh, flat map. You can see the site and the, all the different parcels that the foundation has acquired and the Stern building parcel location. Next slide. Um, there we go. Exterior of the building, uh, old industrial building that's being used as a construction trailer currently, um, kind of been left dilapidated. And um, next slide. 
Uh, interior of the building, you can see the shape, it, it's been left alone. Um, anything you see that is working is probably due to the, to the team working in there for the Cleveland uh, Foundation headquarters. Next slide. Um, upstairs, same thing. Um, you can just see a lot of stuff only really pertaining to new construction next door. Next slide. Uh, the one slide here that I think is really important, the one thing of note that we've been able to discover is the Heckler or Hacker service uh, business that used to be in this building before Stern and this beautiful plaque that is dedicated to the people who have served in the military um, for that business over the time, the time period um, they existed there. We have um, agreed to salvage this plaque and make it a new part of how we display um, the part of the interiors in the Midtown Collaboration Center. Um, Roseanne, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Sorry, no. I couldn't find the no. um, mute button, but no, we um, we definitely, we've arranged, these are being taken down with care and we definitely will um, find the right place for them. Thank you. Um, next slide. And, and then I think this just shows the intent and the location of the Stern building and why uh, we need to take it down in order for the Midtown Collaboration Center uh, to be built on the site. And that, that's really um, the extent of the Stern building. I think we can go into the Midtown Collaboration Center unless there's a question. Commission members? Okay, please proceed to the design. As the committee has asked us, we'll, we'll try and keep it pretty narrow to the changes um, and the comments that we have heard in the past and what we've addressed um, from the committee members during our schematic review. Um, so you can just maybe, next slide. Next slide. Um, just a quick refresher of location, uh, a very important midtown location between downtown and Uptown uh, on the Euclid corridor. Next slide. Um, I think one of the important things to continue to talk about, though, is the East 66th Street improvements and how this is going to be the artery to the neighborhoods in the north and a really true important connection uh, to bring the community onto our site. So I think that's important to touch on throughout this presentation. Next slide. Um, the district plan you see, I think, from last time, it's grown a little bit larger. Mayor Chase has done a good job working with the Dunn Tavern, but we've extended, um, they've extended this kind of idea of this canvas plan up to the northeast towards Magnet to really start to make this neighborhood have this great connectivity through this green infrastructure um, in the district. Next slide, please. Site, um, just to highlight the site location again at, at Euclid 66. Next slide. Um, phasing, so I think this is important. Um, you see existing, phase one is the Midtown Collaboration Center and the temporary parking lot in parcel B. Next slide. Um, building information, this is what we're looking at as maybe a final um, study for the entirety of the block for the Cleveland Foundation um, to help them understand how this um, whole block works collectively um, as we present these projects. Next slide. And I'm gonna let Chris Merritt take over to talk about landscape. Thanks, Nick. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Nick um, set out that kind of broader district context, um, one of the things we wanted to just look at in a little bit more specificity is how the East 66th Street streetscape fits into um, the Midtown Collaboration Center project. So this is a diagram overlaying the, the proposed future improvements to the streetscape um, with where the curb line is today. Um, in short, um, we are coordinating with that team and ensuring that this project uh, kind of meets the, the design recommendations um, with that streetscape. So in green, you can see the future trail that we're accommodating 
Um, and then the remaining uh, uh, planting area and furnishing zone to the existing curb cut that would then get extended out to the red dashed line with the future improvements. Next slide. Um, conceptually, we're thinking about this building and the site along East 66th Street, importantly, as a kind of arts and culture community porch that really creates an identity um, for this development and district, but also uh, a kind of terminus point along the East 66th Street connection. Um, you can see to the north that East West Greenway that would connect the neighborhood, um, the, the screening around the parking lot, um, and then what we're calling the art alley on the west side of the building. Next slide. Uh, within the community uh, porch idea along E66, um, we're thinking about those spaces a couple different ways with a social grove that spills out the north of the building to the Greenway, a public plaza at the entry of the building on E66, um, a collaboration terrace and art garden that then bring the interior uh, programming of the building uh, out into the, the public realm. Next slide. Um, so here you can see a illustrative plan of how this all comes together with the social grove to the north with the um, brewery and music studio using that as, as patio space um, at the Greenway and a kind of welcoming point um, from the neighborhood on East 66th. Um, <clears throat> the public plaza um, at the entry to the building um, kind of mirroring some of the programming at the foundation headquarters as well. Um, and then you can see the, the furnishings and planting along the collaboration terrace and art garden um, on the kind of bottom right uh, of the building there. Um, you're also seeing two bike nodes, um, one um, just at the southwest corner of the building at Euclid um, and one at the top right of the social grove um, at the future Greenway in East 66th. Next slide. Um, we also just for, you know, illustrative reference as we begin to kind of continue to coordinate the future district redevelopment. Um, we're constantly studying how this will phase long term as that temporary parking lot um, is redeveloped. So you can see a potential building massing there and that idea of the art alley on the west side of the building um, expanding and providing a new um, connection from Euclid to the Greenway uh, to the north of the building. Next slide. Um, looking at materials um, in terms of paving, uh, you can see the, the light gray solid area is a um, higher quality concrete um, in a couple of the patio areas. And then the, the more hatched area is a nice concrete paver at the two building entries. Next slide. Um, just a, a material palette for what those pavers um, are likely to be, some crushed stone and smaller areas, and then the concrete paving examples. Next slide. Um, and furnishings, we have a couple seat walls that will be concrete seat walls with um, comfortable um, wood seating tops. Next slide. Um, we also have furnishings throughout um, the site, so at that social grove and along the collaboration terrace a series of movable tables and chairs, um, and then the, a larger collaboration table at that uh, collaboration terrace. Next slide. Um, examples of uh, the furnishings at the, the two bike nodes we're looking at, um, and then the, the uh, litter and recycling bins. Next slide. Um, in terms of planting, you can see the screen planting around the parking lot. Um, and then the, uh, a series of, of planters with both understory perennials, shrubs, and larger canopy trees along the, the east and north side of the building. Next slide. Um, we have a, a series of image, of palette uh, images here. Um, we can click through these slides. Um, so this is the, the tree canopy. Uh, the next slide is, is shrubs, so showing some structure and winter interest, some evergreen. Next slide. And then perennials, um, lots of color, uh, native planting. And then the next slide is our uh, perenni uh, grasses and ferns mix. Next slide. Um, we're also providing for reference the, the full plant schedule. Next slide. Um, and then we can click through these. These are a series of, of landscape character prece precedents. Oh, um, we'll just move that. There's a, a, little, a little bit of feedback, but I think this concludes my section of the presentations. Thank you. I, I saw a question pop up during that 
um, oh. in, in the chats during the presentation about bike racks. I did not see you posted. Can we can we address that question? Yes. No. Is that from Kaylee Merson? Uh, this is Allison Henny. Callie is on a phone call at the moment, um, but she did put in the chat. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, for the zoning requirements, the bicycle parking should be as close to the building entrances as the nearest handicapped automobile parking spaces. So if we could zoom into those areas to verify that. So, she said nearest non-handicapped spaces in her chat. Is it is it is it supposed to be non-handicapped spaces? Uh, so Yes, I think she's intending to say the handicapped spaces spaces should remain at the location and then the most adjacent uh, parking space to that. Yes, we're, we're happy to do that. I know that working with the pet bot committee and, and the director, we were asked to have a bike kind of node at the at that at our alley entrance. Um, so that would be the main kind of Space for that. We do have another set of bike racks off, off by the greenway that I think we could talk about how to relocate those closer um, to those main entrances, and, and we'd be happy to do that. Um, but just to, just to move on, uh, this is our zoning um, analysis, and we did receive approval from the zoning uh, just this week, so we're happy to have received that. And thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, building plans just indicating all the entry locations for both tenants, uh, exterior kind of street front tenants, and then the, the main um, portion of the building. <laughs> Excuse me, next slide. Uh, four plans above just indicating, you know, common corridors as we work through the tenants. You can skip through precedent, I believe. Um, skip through that. And if we're just addressing I think right here is a good spot. So the, the committee asked us to re, um, reanalyze the materials of the building in relationship to the foundation. So before we had a white canopy with uh, darker metals above, we did go back and look at the foundation's headquarters, <coughs> excuse me, and we went to a more uniform uh, black to charcoalish uh, metal palette for both the storefronts, the glazing above, and the canopy and signage fans that relates back to the color of the building uh, uh, for the Cleveland Foundation headquarters. Along with that, you'll see in the renderings as we get to them shortly, we've also taken the approach of using very similar light fixtures on the exterior of the building and in the parking lots that were part of the Foundation headquarters project as well. Um, I think we also trimmed off the canopy and kind of cleaned it up to minimal construction tolerances, which kind of relates against the canopy across um, that the delicate nature of the canopy. And that was really, I think, the, the majority of the comments from Euclid Corridor. So if we go to the next slide, um, next slide, we'll skip sections, next slide. Here we go, you can, there we are, that's perfect. You can start to see the, the metals palette that is more consistent uh, from above to below the canopy and its relationship to the color of the Cleveland Foundation's uh, project across the street. Next slide. Um, again, you can just see the metals wrapping around and it does feel holistically, I believe, across the building, uh, a better approach. Next slide, Euclid face, um, just so you can kind of see that. And then the next slide, which I do want to pause on for a brief moment, because we are asking to come back for signage approval in the future. Um, we are working with the client for the appropriate naming of the building. Um, but I think this west facade uh, we talked about last time, the mural will also be part of that. Um, coming back for the final mural artwork, the artwork shown here is not the complete artwork, but the foundation is working with both Cleveland Institute of Art and Assembly for the Arts to come up with what is the program? Uh, is it with the students? Is it with local artists uh, to create that final mural, which will then bring back to the city? Um, and that I think that's oh well. The next couple slides are site lighting, um, just 
standard site lighting. We have some existing street light locations that will remain until future phases when the 66th Street um, is a little bit more complete in their design analysis of, of the expansion down to the Foundation and Midtown Collaboration Center. Um, again, the lighting pretty much matches um, the foundation. You can see our, our spill off outside of our site is not great at all. Next slide. Um, and then the cut sheets, I think the one thing that we'll point out is other than illuminated signage, there are a few sconces lighting the terracotta of the building at the piers only to kind of emphasize the shadow and the texture of the building. Um, next slide. And then we, yep, signage, um, signage location. And then the final slide, which we'll come back with, illustrates the approach for signage, but we'll be changing potentially names, fonts, um, and tenant, specific tenant signage in the future. Thank you, very, very thorough. This is an exciting project. Um, commission members, I'd like to entertain a motion for demolition first, then, then we can move to the design portion. I move approval for demolition incorporating um, the historic plaque in the new building. And I second. Um, Michael, could you call the roll, please? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Abstain. McRae Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Um, and the we need to address the Euclid Corridor Design Review item number thirty one, which is what was just presented. Um, any discussion on on that, Commission members? No, I move approval. Downing. And I second McCray Scott. Michael, could you, could you go call the roll, please? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. I mean, abstain. I'm sorry. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Well, this is exciting, guys. Good luck. Um, this is right down the street from our house, so this is a wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank and you we all. Heard, we we you. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the whole committee. Appreciate Hi, it very much. Okay, let's get back on course here. We have a couple things to get through. I think the next are mandatory referrals. Um, ordinance number 1144-2022, um, authorizing director of capital projects to apply to the to the District 1 Public Works Integrating Committee for state funding for the construction of Superior Midway. Good morning, Commission members. My name is Callie Mersman. I'm the Senior Strategist for Transit and Mobility with the City of Cleveland, and I'm here to present on both the Superior Midway as well as the Lorraine Midway. I think we're a few yeah, up from here in the presentation. Go ahead, Callie. It's All interesting. right. So, so as you may recall from a recent Planning Commission meeting, we shared some general mobility updates where we talked about both the Superior Midway as well as the Lorraine Midway. These are two major capital projects that will enhance bicycle connectivity and specifically separated protected bicycle connectivity across the city. Um, the superior midway section is the initial corridor building on a citywide midway cycle track plan that uh, laid out a citywide connection, as you can see in the image on the right-hand side. Next slide, please. This plan established a general center lane typology for bicycle connections, as you can see here, um, buffered by landscaped medians in the center of the roadway. Next slide, please. The Superior Midway Capital Project will run from the east side of Public Square to East 55th Street along Superior Avenue. Some general concept renderings of what this could look like are shown on the right side. Next slide, please. 
So the city has been doing some preliminary community engagement on this specific concept over the course of this summer and fall, including um, engaging with businesses on their access needs along the corridor. Uh, we are poised to begin preliminary design um, and uh, work with a consultant on moving toward construction early next year. Next slide, please. The design cost estimate is almost $2.4 million. This will be funded by a combination of CMAC funds, congestion mitigation and air quality funds, uh, which are federal funds and matched by a local contribution of $900,000 of road and bridge bonds. The construction estimate for this portion of the roadway is approximately $22.7 million, again, funded through CMAC, as well as the required 20% city share. And we're working to uh, build out that city share, the, um, the district one funding application that the director of capital projects is pursuing would help to alleviate the, the city's portion of that local match. So the total estimated project cost is just over $25 million. Next slide, please. So, as I said, our next steps are to start detailed design and engineering early next year with a target construction launch in mid-2025 with completion by October 2026. Next slide, please. So I, would you like me to go ahead and present about Lorraine as well or pause here for any questions about the Superior Midway? Well, I, let's, there's two different ordinances, so we need to, we need to entertain this one first. Okay. Are there any questions from the commission? I move approval, Downing. I second McCray Scott. Michael, would you call the roll, please? Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Kelly, I do recall one comment that we made when, when you presented the plan about lane widths, studying the, the, you know, reducing those so that they're hopefully help calm traffic. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next under ordinance under um, mandatory referrals refers to capital projects to apply for uh, accepting funding for the re re rehabilitation of Lorraine Avenue from West 65th to West 20th. Um, are you presenting this one as well? I am, yes. All right. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so many of you, you can keep going forward to the next slide. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this project as the Lorraine Cycle Track. We have been under discussion since about 2013. Um, in conversations with stakeholder groups and key uh, advocates for these projects, we are combining them and again, that overall midway network of citywide separated bikeway connectivity. So as we begin and continue to talk about the midway projects across the city, um, the idea of the Midway is a network similar to the Indianapolis Cultural Trail that has a unified um, rider experience for people riding from east to west and vice versa across the city. So um, as part of that collaboration, we're moving forward with this project under the Midway banner, um, calling it the Lorraine Midway moving forward. So the physical scope of this project is Lorraine Avenue from West 65th Street to West 20th Street, meeting right up to the multi-use path that exists on the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge currently. This typical cross-section of right-of-way in the section of the corridor is approximately 66 feet wide with curb to curb dimensions of about 46 feet wide and 10 foot sidewalks on each direction. Next slide, please. So this specific piece of Lorraine Avenue is a continuation of investment, capital investment along Lorraine Avenue over the last more than a decade. So in 2010, the city um, resurfaced, did a capital project on Lorraine up to West 150th. In 2017, they moved a little bit east to um, the segment from 150th to West 117th. And most recently, West 117th to West 65th Street was resurfaced And each of those projects um, added some pedestrian safety enhancements, pedestrian refuge island, streetscape, and bike lanes. And this is a um, this will be a higher level separated bicycle facility on the segment from West 65th to West 20th. This remaining section, the design is being guided by the Living Lorraine Improvement Plan from 2013 and the updated design concept that was adopted in 2015. Next slide, please. 
you can move forward. I outlined how this fits in with the overall goal of separated bikeways across the city. And so this cross section is a little bit different on Lorraine because of the existing dimensions of the roadway. We're not talking about a center aligned facility. This would be on the side of the road. And so you see there are designated areas for pedestrians um, on both sides of the street. The bicycle facility would be a two way bike facility separated uh, with a buffer from a parking lane and a travel lane in each direction. This is a sidewalk level bicycle facility. Next slide, please. And so building on the 2013 and 2015 plans um, in 2021, last summer, the city created and launched a project website to collect a little bit more public input and to confirm that this is the direction we wanted to move in going forward. Um, what was outlined as option one in that website, again, the sidewalk level bicycle facility was confirmed as the public desire and direction. And so um, the design that we're moving into now follows the intent of that configuration. Next slide, please. So the cost estimate for this project is almost three, sorry, $30.2 million. For construction right now, we have about half of this raised. And so this ordinance is um, embarking on the design process for the project so that we can more competitively pursue additional construction funding. Next slide, please. So the next steps from the city's perspective are to pursue the preliminary plans and environmental documentation. Um, we will be issuing an RFP for design early next year, and we'll expect that design process to go through December 2024. Through that, pro through that process and that time, we will continue to apply for construction funding um, to uh, allow us to pursue final design and move into construction. Next slide, please. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have about this project. Commission members. I move approval, Downing. Second, McCray Scott. Roll, please, oh, Michael. Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Callie. Thank you very much. Oh, we have one more item under mandatory referrals. It's ordinance number 1212-2022. It's authorizing the commission of purchases and supplies to sell certain city owned property no longer needed for the city public use on West 22nd Street to 1869 West 22nd LLC for, um, for residential for, for residential development. Sorry, um, who might be here? I'm here, uh, Suzanne DeGenero, Commissioner of Real Estate for the City of Cleveland. Thank you, Chairman, uh, members of the Commission. I also have the owner, Brian Spear, um, and his architect, Paul Began here. Um, so this legislation would authorize the sale of land to, uh, to Mr. Spear for development. Um, the geography is a little bit confusing here, so that's why I've got this um, um, Pretty survey drawing for you. Uh, the um, the parcel in question, uh, which is owned by Mr. Spear on West 22nd Street, uh, is shown on the GIS as including three additional parcels, which are actually city owned parcels. And when Mr. Spear brought the property, um, it wasn't clear. It wasn't obvious that these were not part of of the uh, of the. Um, parcel. If you go to the next slide, Michael, uh, Ariel might help. So where the orange dot is, that's city property, even though the GIS shows it as being one parcel. Uh, and Mr. Spear owns the apartment building um, to the northwest there. Um, um, if you go to the next slide, I think I have a picture of the apartment building. So this is the existing building. Mr. Spear intends to uh, renovate this building and expand it somewhat um, and uh, build um, a parking structure with a covered deck at the rear of the property um, and needs the city parcels to, um, you know, for access and also for the expansion of the building. Um, the three city parcels that you saw there in the first survey drawing were acquired by the city in the uh, early 40s for 
playground use. Um, and at some point subsequent to that, the playground equipment was removed. And um, uh, after that, there was a cul-de-sac um, put on the property. And if you go back to the aerial, maybe a couple sides back or one side back, you can see the cul-de-sac there for, for people to turn around. Uh, the intention is to split off that portion of the roadway from the balance of the property and um, that's the portion that that will be sold to Mr. Spear. Um, yep, yeah, I'm sorry. Yep, um, that's and Mr. Uh, Spear has his architect here who can uh, um, speak to the design, but this is the proposal for the expansion. The existing building will be saved and. Um, it's quite a handsome design um, and yes, the site plan indicates the access that will need to be um, constructed off the cul-de-sac there. You can see to the to the right of the slide and then the I believe the, the gray hashed porch portions, the darker gray are the new new areas to be uh, constructed. Um, the property is about 4,400 square feet, about a tenth of an acre. Um, accepting the roadway. And so that is the portion that will be sold to Mr. Spear. Um, Ward 3 Council Member McCormick has expressed support. And um, as I mentioned, I have the owner and his architect here uh, who can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeGenero. You're welcome. Commission members? Move approval, Downing. I second McCray Scott. Roll, please, Michael. Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay. Thank um, you. Next item or series of administrative approvals that you guys can take just a couple, a minute or so, just to review them before making a motion. I'll move approval. And I'll second. Roll, please, Michael. Anthony. Yes. Downing. Yes. Zucker. Yes. McCray Scott. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay. I do have a question for 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 Michael. We have a special presentation on the townhouse code. Is that going to require a vote, Michael? Um, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, this will not require a vote. It's just to give you some background information as to where it's going. It is not entirely complete yet, but Shannon wanted to get in front of you and show you the intent and where it, where it wants to go. Okay, good. So, um, Shannon, is Shannon here? Mr. Acting Chair, is, is there, are there any other items that do require a vote after uh, this? No, at least not what I know. Okay. We're, we're, we're through the agenda. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good observation. Um, is, did we lose Shannon? I'm here. Oh, okay. Well, Shannon, this is, uh, this has been hotly contested and, and, and anticipated, I should say, and, uh, I'm going to turn this over to you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fluger. Uh, Shannon Leonard, Chief Zoning Planner, City Planning Commission. Um, and so, as you have just stated, this is a hot topic. Um, and so, I'll kind of walk you through some of the goals and uh, where we're going. Um, and so, as you know, this has been a hotly debated topic since the update in 2018. And so, part of our um, big thing here with this particular update is, you know, the original update 
was really, uh, you know, the goals were to uh, make sure that we respect private property rights. We bring predictability and clarity uh, to townhouse code. Uh, we have efficiency and customer service. In other words, we are streamlining the permitting process. Um, we also create safe and walkable neighborhoods, and we really promote uh, missing middle housing um, and for infill development, gentle density. Um, and so also, in addition to that, we have to also balance um, protecting the public health, safety, comfort, and general welfare of all citizens of Cleveland. We also have to provide safe and walkable neighborhoods. Uh, we need to provide transparency for process as well as um, how development occurs in the city of Cleveland. We need to promote community. Uh, and then we also need to help ensure that we have context responsive compatibility uh, within our neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And so how do we provide this balance? Um, with this update, we're hoping to clarify process and definitions uh, based on user feedback. Uh, we want to refine the conditional use in a single and two family provision uh, within this section of the zoning code. Uh, we want to add some definitions and regulations around uh, motor courts, and we also need to address the interior frontages provision, especially for interior lots. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's been a lot of questions about how does uh, the process work when you come in uh, for a townhouse. So generally an applicant uh, submits a townhouse project application. It generally is support, uh, submitted to building and housing. At that time, it's assigned to a residential or commercial zoning plans examiner and routed to city planning. Uh, it's either routed to the neighborhood planner or it's routed directly to us here in the zoning section. Uh, what I generally do when I get an application is there is a specific requirement regarding how to determine density. Uh, and that's based on the existing setbacks uh, of that particular street where the lot is located. Uh, and so we use the same setback calculation 100 feet in each direction to come up with the average setback and that would dictate basically the density in the zoning code of what that density could be an RA1, which is the least dense or RA3, which is the most dense uh, based on the setback. Uh, and then we review that application under that RA district. At that time, if that application is located in a district uh, less than multifamily, so a one family or two family, uh, we'll schedule them for planning commission for you all to determine that conditional use. Uh, once we adjudicate it, we either communicate directly with the applicant and say, hey, these are the areas that you're not compliant or these are the areas you are compliant. And either at that time they can make corrections and resubmit, or we'll just com communicate that with the building and housing zoning examiner uh, and they will communicate directly with the client uh, or applicant and then determine uh, if the applicant wants to make revisions or if they don't want to make revisions or can't make revisions, then they would be issued a letter of nonconformance, which would lead to them needing to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so generally when you have a use in a single family or two family uh, district, these are the this is like how the approval process works, right? Uh, if it's in a single family or two family, it needs to go to planning commission for conditional use. If it's in multifamily or less restricted, if it meets all aspects of the zoning code, it's permitted by right. Uh, and then almost ev or every single townhouse unit or project goes to design review. If it's five or less units, it goes to uh, the local uh, landmarks or regular design review district or housing design review subcom subcommittee. And if it's more than five units, it goes to uh, the local design review committees uh, and then moves on through that process. And I won't go through it completely right here, but if anybody has any questions, I, I'll be more than happy to walk you through that process. Next slide, please. Uh, and so prior to the update in 2018, what we were seeing was a lot of projects needing to need, um, you know, five, six variances, and they were constantly generally almost always approved at Board of Zoning Appeals. And so the idea was with this update was to uh, you know, really streamline the permitting process uh, for development. Next slide, please. And so under the current code, the way that the reviews are done is they've streamlined the process. The adjudication is pretty simple, uh, not only for our staff and new staff, but also uh, residents, developers, architects. Uh, they can also understand the conforming and non-conforming elements of any development that comes through. Next slide, please. 
And so just quick background, the townhouse code has been changed throughout the years. There's been updates over time as our zoning code is a living document and it provides that flexibility to update with it as the times change. Uh, since 2018, when this version of the townhouse code uh, was put in place, there's been 25 plus townhouse projects completed or they're under development. There's a little bit more now since this was last updated. At, since that time, there's been zero variances requested, meaning that the applicants have gone back when they have been non-conforming as they have and made the corrections to meet the code as it is currently written. Uh, and then we've also had a lot of community feedback, as you're aware, um, and we've met with different groups and talked to different people, uh, and there's been different articles about it uh, throughout the community. Next slide, please. And so prior to the 2018 code, uh, these were some of the projects that were uh, permitted by right. Next slide. Next slide, please. And then after 2018, we started to see you know, better projects being developed. And I'm just gonna put this out here for all the pictures. This is not to be um, too critical of any particular development project, uh, but uh, this is what we're seeing here in our community. Uh, and so next slide, please. And so this is another example after the current code that was adopted in which uh, we had West 98th and Lake that's often cited as a good example of a townhouse project in our neighborhoods. Um, and this is really, the reasons for that is the townhouse placement is on the site is tiered. There's an interior cart courtyard with a lot of landscaping and balconies creating community. And then there's minimal visitor parking at the rear only. Next slide, please. And this is an example also of how, you know, new development can fit in with uh, our historic context to the street. Uh, so with the front setbacks and the placement on the site being appropriate, and then the heights of the horizontal architectural features um, align with adjacent properties. Next slide, please. Um, another good example is West 58th and Furman. This is often cited by the community. The auto court is interior to the site and not generally visible from the right of way. There's minimal amount of curb cuts. And then there's a pedestrian passageway and landscaping on the interior frontage. Next slide, please. Uh, again, the auto court is interior to the site. There's a good, for the interior frontages, it is fronting a public open space, which is a public park, uh, City of Cleveland Public Park. Uh, and then the entry in the architectural language is consistent with the context of the surrounding properties. Next slide, please. This is another good example along East 120th and Ashbury, which really speaks to the neighborhood. Next slide, please. And again, this is at West 47th and Lorraine. Uh, these were townhouses that were permitted after the adoption of the code. It fits into the scale. There could be some improvements on the interior lot side yard. Next slide, please. Uh, but then there were also some projects that um, have been the talk of the town, right? They're not the greatest projects. They really exploit um, some of the problems in the zoning code. Uh, um, and so next slide, please. Again, this is another example of cited as maybe not the best development. Next slide, please. And then again, West 74th here, you have a lack of landscaping. You have a lack of architectural features. You have black, black blank walls that do not lend to uh, being walkable or pedestrian friendly. Uh, and then you also have some meters and utilities that are prominent on the corners that do not encourage walkability. And so this is a good example of where like our zoning code clashed with the building code. Uh, and so once it got through design review and planning and all of those great things, they got to building and housing. And so they had to make some tweaks that were maybe not necessarily what we thought we had approved uh, because of the building code or the fire code. Uh, and this is the end uh, product. And so next slide, please. And so with that being said, we have good projects, we have not so great projects and the zoning code is able to be changed. Uh, and I'm not so emotionally connected to the previous uh, regulations that I'm too stubborn to want to change the code and make it better to get a better outcome for our land and the city of Cleveland for not just you know the development community, but also for you know, all of our citizens. Uh, and so with that, we think some of these changes can help get there. We may not all the way be there yet, uh, but we are going to try. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that I think will help uh, get to what we are trying to see here in the city and balance those goals. Uh, so the townhouse unit is currently defined as either a single or two family dwelling on its own lot, served by its own exclusive exterior pedestrian entrance and attached to one or more other such units by the firewall or fire separation walls. 
A new definition that you saw in July 2021 was for a townhouse project. This is any combination of single family detached dwelling units, townhouse units, or townhouse buildings submitted to the city as a unified development proposal. Additional language that we would like to add that I've been working with our architect and our other zoning staff and neighbor planners is when a single family detached dwelling unit is part of a townhouse project proposal and fronts the public right away, they must be contiguous with other units. The single family detached dwelling units cannot exceed one third of the total unit count for the project in order to be reviewed under this zoning code. And then principal street frontage, there's been a lot of talk about what exactly is a principal street frontage. Uh, we are just going to change that to primary street frontage um, based on feedback from the community, as well as architects and developers, as well as our new form based code. Let's just make it all the same. It'll be primary street frontage. Next slide, please. Uh, and so what does that mean in terms of the how it's going to be regulated when you have a single unit fronting the public right away, it needs to be contiguous as shown in this example. Uh, next slide. But you could also have a single unit that looks exactly like all the other units. It's still a townhouse unit. It's still a, um, a townhouse unit on its own lot, but it doesn't front the public right away. So it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, contiguous, but it can be judged under this, um, reviewed under the townhouse code. Next slide, please. So this is that example. Next slide, please. Uh, and then also when we are talking about the conditional use that you all see all, you know, every couple weeks, um, really clearing up this area of this section of the zoning code, uh, with some better terminology and definitions. And so. Really, this will be townhouses and townhouse projects are permitted as a conditional use in any district which such use is not permitted by right, i.e. single and two family districts. City Planning Commission, it now says City Planning Director, it should say City Planning Commission shall determine whether the proposal meets all applicable standards established to ensure proper design and compatibility with surrounding uses. And then also understanding that all townhouses go through the design review process as previously mentioned. Next slide, please. And so currently this is a very wordy um, section and this has been passed along uh, over time as to how do you grant the conditional use? What is that criteria for the conditional use kind of similar to the project earlier today? Uh, and so really um, clarifying this for you all so that you know exactly what you're looking at and maybe making it a little bit less wordy. Uh, next slide, please. And so really it would be standards and conditions set forth below and to determine whether the proposal meets all applicable standards established to ensure proper design and compatibility with surrounding structures. So when you're deciding should townhouse use be permitted in single family and two family districts, uh, you are trying, you will uh, be after design review, obviously, you all will make the ultimate determination of whether that development is constant with or complementary to uh, nearby properties that says, or, but it should be, and, uh, with respect to such elements as height, front yard, setback, roof form, building entrances and frontage features and circulation and parking. And, um, 1 of the new members, uh, at the last planning commission said, Hey, Shannon, is, is there a criteria for each of these? And so we'll have them written in written form in the regulations, but I'm going to show you some examples. Next slide, please. And so basically what we're saying is that it's not the position of the planning commission or the staff to dictate a particular style or type of residential architecture to be built, but rather it's up to the applicant to really show compatibility of their project, uh, of their townhome project in single family or two family zone districts. And so the applicant would do this by giving you, giving us a scaled site plan and street elevations, as well as photographs, which Chair Fluker often asks for showing, you know, the proposed construction within the relevant area of the existing context, context, which is basically 250 feet in all directions. And so how does the height and front yard setback meet? It'd be up to the applicant to show this in their presentation, showing you that the heights are the same, the front yard setback is in context. Next slide, please. They'd also need to show relevant uh, relative height and massing in the surrounding context. So um, last year, there was a project at 5908 Lawn Avenue that the architect and developer really did a great presentation for you all that we use to show other uh, developers and architects, hey, this is what we need to help the planning commission make that determination and show they're showing you that, yeah, this is a new construction. This is a new building in 2021, but this is how it fits into the relative context in terms of height massing in the surrounding area. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then also roof forms and frontage features. Are the roof forms for the street appropriate? Is it gabled roofs? I think this is an excellent example of a townhouse project that not only shows the proper roof form along Franklin, but also really great frontage features in terms of how it interacts with the public. Next slide, please. And again, this is the frontage uh, features that are required uh, per each uh, district, whether determining based on the density of the project. Next slide. Uh, and then the last thing that, that, that you need to look at is circulation and parking. Is there enough um, room for emergency vehicles to get in? Is there good mid block connectivity? Is there um, minimizing curb cuts, increasing the walkability of the area? Uh, and so there, this is another uh, condition of the conditional use. Next slide, please. And so in addition to that, we are adding some definitions. Uh, and so it has been proposed for like when we're talking about auto courts, because those are not defined, uh, building and housing would like us to use the word motor court. Uh, so auto court was presented to you back in July 2021 with this definition. They would like us to change it to motor court as motor vehicle is already defined in the zoning code. In addition, an internal alley is not the appropriate word. Alley is currently defined as from the public right of way. And so we are proposing a scratching alley and adding private road and then defining private road in 325, which would be a privately owned or controlled and maintained drive street road or lane that provides the primary means of vehicular ingress or egress to where two or more lots or dwelling units share a common access drive, even if such lot has required frontage on a public road uh, for townhouse projects that allow vehicular pedestrian and bicycle access from a public right of way to public private garages. Uh, our zoning code currently regulates yards and courts, which is setbacks and courtyards uh, in 357. And so in this case, when we're talking about motor courts specifically for townhouse projects, those court regulations in 357.16 would not apply. Next slide, please. And so this is just showing you uh, that this would be a private road uh, as well as a motor court. Next slide. Uh, and so some of the regulations that you all have requested us add uh, for these motor courts. So motor courts are where, you know, the pedestrians and vehicles are going to meet automatically. Uh, and so the proposal in July 2021 was to add 25 square feet of dedicated landscaping in a motor court for every 32 feet of garage door or garage entry visible from the public right away, not including alleys. Uh, but as a staff and from the feedback that we received, um, we are exploring other options as the 25 square feet may really not be achieving what uh, the city would like to see. And so some of the options that we are exploring is that the motor court should be screened and the garage entry shall not be visible from the public right away. Um, in other words, not only from what the public has uh, given us in terms of feedback as well as you have, but is doing research for um, townhouse projects across the United States and across the world, you know, motor courts really should not be centric in our developments on our uh, for infill development. Um, next slide, please. And so what that really comes down to is if you have seven 16 foot garage doors visible from the public right away, then you would need 100 square feet of landscaping. Next slide, please. And so while that might add to the um, to the projects that you see here on the left hand side of the screen, they're really not that 25 square feet is not going to achieve what you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen. So we have not yet come up with a concrete uh, solution to adding more landscape. I just don't think 25 square feet is going to get us what the city really wants to see in our auto courts. Um, and so uh, we're open to feedback on that. Next slide, please. And so additionally, uh, we are requiring that uh, the auto courts uh, with garage doors or garage entry visible from the public right away shall have at least 60% of its surface area paved with human scaled materials. Next slide, please. So essentially that's differentiating where pedestrians are versus where vehicles go um, by using, you know, different types of uh, pavers uh, within the auto court or the motor court. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to that, and I forgot the slide, I apologize. One of the requirements that you guys had asked for uh, back last year when we were, when this came before you before was requiring the um, pedestrian doors or man doors into the auto court. And so the proposal is that for each muse unit in a townhouse building with more than three shared walls shall provide two ground floor pedestrian entrances 
And when any of those units is more than 150 feet from the street right away, they shall provide a pedestrian entrance directly to the auto court or motor court. Next slide, please. And so this is just an example of the different types of uh, pavers that are used to differentiate between the uh, pedestrian versus where vehicles generally go, as well as uh, adding those pedestrian frontages into where the motor court is. Next slide. Uh, and so a few more definitions. Uh, so currently interior lot is defined as a lot other than a corner lot. Uh, we're proposing adding with other only one frontage on a street other than an alley. So this is often referred to as a mid block lot, as you can see in the image here. Uh, if you imagine there's streets to the north and to the south and then a through lot would be defined as a lot other than a corner lot with frontage on more than one street other than an alley. Next slide, please. Some other definitions that currently exist is the principal pedestrian entrance. And this is an exterior door exclusive to the dwelling unit that offers a pedestrian the most visible and direct means of ingress into a public right of way. And we're proposing adding the term or private walkway. Uh, and then private walkway would be defined as any sidewalk or passageway located on a privately owned property. And then adding the term pedestrian muse. This is a privately owned and maintained pedestrian route visible from the street which provides public access and address access to individual buildings and units within a larger development site. And it may be considered a privately owned public, publicly accessible space for through lots. And then also defining the word muse unit, which is any townhouse unit on interior frontage and whose principal pedestrian entrance is located opposite of a motor court, but fronting a private walkway at the side lot line. Next slide, please. And so this is an example of MUSE units. Uh, and as you can see, these units are fronting the side lot line, and then they have access for a private walkway, um, and they're considered pedestrian MUSE. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is one of, the, one of the biggest issues, I think, while we can talk about the motor courts and how they can be problematic, I think one of the biggest problems of our current townhouse code is that we really accent these interior frontages as well as the MUSE units. And so from here to Toronto, everywhere I've read, I haven't found any other city that allows these types of units uh, fronting the side lot lines. Uh, and in fact, you're supposed to avoid situations where front yards face backyards or where backyards and side yards front the street. And that's really to increase safety and walkability, not just for the new development, but also for the existing context or the existing, uh, especially single family and two family homes. Uh, and so some of the things that we're exploring internally is to only allow permit uh, those interior frontages within with pedestrian use only on through lots. Uh, and this is really to promote mid block connectivity. And I think that's like some of the original intent was that if you could, you know, break up some of these blocks with these, uh, you know, these frontages where you could really activate the passageways and the pedestrian use uh, and really make it a space, not only just for those people living there, but also the public to get through through our neighborhoods uh, and make them more walkable. That was the intent. Uh, and then again, permit interior frontages on interior lots that front public space, which we've seen um, has already been a great example with Scion Park that fronts the, uh, the public park there at West 58th and Herman. And then the other thing is exploring, well, maybe we can permit these interior frontages in all three districts, RA1, RA2, and RA3, but they need to be set back 10 feet. And that would allow for room for frontage features uh, for more pedestrian use and activating that space, not just for private, but also for the public to use as a cut through, uh, and also to allow for more uh, common yard open space for the residents. Next slide, please. And so these, again, are examples of where those pedestrian use works out. Uh, on the image on the right, that's Scion Park at West 58th and Herman, where they have the space to front a public uh, open space. And then uh, the other project, which allows, it's not really a mid-block um, cut through, but it does cut through to the public park. Next slide, please. And so the other thing that we want to focus on, uh, on some of the new regulations is to ensure that the buildings fit within the existing or planned context by providing an appropriate downward transition and scale to lower scale buildings, parks, and open space uh, for either if we continue to allow those interior frontage units or just in general, that this is how there should be some step down and some transition when you are next to um, residents of lower density or in districts of uh, a lower density. Next slide, please. 
And so that is where we are. The intent here is um, we've made a commitment to put these changes that we've uh, added onto our website this afternoon to allow for public comment and feedback for 30 days. Uh, that time will actually start on Monday uh, and run until January 5th. Uh, and then we'll take those comments, make some changes if we want to make some changes or we think that it's best to make changes to balance those goals that I talked about previously, uh, the community, but also understanding the need for affordable housing and infill developments in our neighborhoods where we have vacant lots. Uh, and then go from there before we come back to you all uh, for a vote and to move it through the legislative process. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. That was very thorough. I understood it, which is scary. Um, <laughs> but but more importantly, I, I I appreciate your intentionality and not and looking beyond City of Cleveland for best practices. I'm going to open it up for comment. I. I think uh, Commissioner Anthony has her hand up. Thank you, Vice Chair Fluker. Shannon, thank you. Um, I, I've only been in two meetings, but I can already tell you are extremely thorough um, and, and, and speak in, play, in plain speak. Uh, so thank you for that, uh, for presenting in a way that um, encompasses the technical aspects of what is something that's very complicated, but makes it very understandable. Um, so thank you. Uh, my, one of my questions was going to be about the public comment. So you just spoke to that. So uh, procedurally, if you can just help me understand once the public period, pu public comment period closes and this comes back to the commission uh, before it moves to the legislative process, are there any requirements that uh, require for you in the department to have any community meetings uh, to have additional dialogue about the proposed updates? Uh, thank you uh, through the chair to the commission member. So there is no um, requirements for us to have public meetings or public comment, but um, we could definitely explore that um, before coming back to you. Generally, the planning commission serves as the public meeting uh, for these types of things, including map changes and other conditional uses. Thank you so much, Shannon. And council. Any any other comments or, or observations, questions? Just that it was a lot to take in, and I'll be one of the people looking at it on the website to formulate formulate more questions. Well, thanks, thanks, Commissioner uh, Slide. I I I I think it's 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 a great start. I and I I would just like to advocate for in the future as we start. Um, bringing more change changes to the code like form based code that we allow that period you know that gestation period for lack of a better term right um obviously it's going to have to go live but being cognizant of the fact that you know we may have to adjust things as we go along even after it's out there because there's always there's always loopholes in someone's mind right there's always a way to to work around things so i think i think um this approach has, has proved to be beneficial. Um, you have any more comments, staff? Anyone else would like to make a comment before before we entertain the, the next portion of our meeting? Right. Thank you, Shannon. As always, you, you've always you shine you shine you shine the light on things in a, in a very clear manner. Thank you. I think the last thing we have is the director's report. We got one more thing. Can we do? Uh oh. Yeah. Oh, Adam Dab report, the process. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's all good. This is a kind of an informational presentation, just like Shannon's. Uh, so I'm I'm looking for some feedback here as well. Uh, this is also kind of a long time coming and um you know, under the onus of, or under the, under the purview of kind of, you know, hearing some, some feedback externally as well as internally, right? So some of these changes that I'll talk about in the next few slides are really meant to bring down our, um, our neighborhood planning administration here internally, kind of red tape wise, but also make it very clear and, um, uh, from a process standpoint for applicants who are coming to us for for building permits and and throughout the design review process 
So kind of think about that when, when I'm talking about some of these proposed changes and, and streamlining that process. Um, Maurice, you can flip to the next slide. So uh, the first things that we would like to kind of uh, change up front are our term limits, attendance policies for, for the committees. So providing a, a structure for uh, kind of kind of growth within the committee, right? We, I, I think we all really value the, the members that we have in the committees, but we do want to rotate people through or, you know, if there's open spots on, on the full planning commission or the full landmarks commission, we would, we would do that, that as well. Um, these, these, all these changes that I'm going to be talking about today are for the local committees that the local design review committees, the local landmarks committees that we have around town in, in different districts that the, both the neighborhood planners and landmark staff administer here. So, um, defining some chair term limits, um, as well as vice chair limits as well. Um, defining a, um, a tenure total for committee members. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of, uh, committee members who have been on for for a great deal of time. That's 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 amazing. We very much appreciate their service, but we do want to give a chance to to other um, uh, younger design professionals around town as well, um, and, and look to kind of their advice. Um, kind of setting a an attendance policy for members, um, and then also kind of the appointment process for for vice chair and chair. Next slide, please. Uh, a big one that we um, we can pause here and talk about, or we can talk about it afterwards, is is defining a public comment policy at the local committee. So this is kind of this is this is tricky. I mean, this is this is something that we've been thinking about for a while, but um, I, I, I definitely want to voice and talk about today. Um, what we're proposing at the moment is is going with a um, a letter, a written based policy for the local committees. So those letters will be submitted in advance, 48 hours of the meetings where staff can compile those and share with the members. Um, we want the local committees to focus on the design discussion. And I think we wanna drive the verbal public comment to either the full commission or towards the, like the, the Board of Zone Appeals hearings, Board of Building Standards hearings. Um, some additional context for that reasoning, um, you know, these are, these committees are, are composed of volunteers. Um, most of the larger controversial or development projects around town are often hosting public meetings, um, whether that's by the local council member or the community development corporation. Um, and then many of those committee committees are comprised of um, members who live in the neighborhoods and who would have their neighbors coming to comment about those projects too. And that kind of gets into a, a tricky kind of gray area, I feel like. Um, I think coupled with this is kind of what Shannon talked about very briefly, but we do want to find a way, um, the city is updating its website. We're going through a lot of technology changes here. Uh, we're going to try and work on a very kind of robust, very public facing way of hosting these notices online and and taking public comment also that way um and and having like a comment period for for larger projects so whether that's you know by a certain scale you know we maybe it's a unit count based scale or a square footage scale something like that for mixed use or retail projects that we can we can kind of set that threshold threshold at uh next slide uh in tandem with with, with some of the updates to the committee's kind of process, we do want to host a kind of a quarterly education series for members. Um, and I think we should, um, you know, if applicable, we could do this with the full commissions as well. Um, you know, trainings or briefings on some of the policy updates, uh, ethics, like the demolition process, um, you know, really diving into the language around the urban form overlay or pedestrian retail overlay. Um, we can, uh, we're going to aim to, you know, record these uh, for people who cannot be present, but we want to kind of do a continuing education series for members so they're always kind of up, up to date and on, on the same page as, as staff. Next slide. Uh, and then more external facing things, um, kind of updating the, the internal documents, right? Um, making it 
uh, some of these are, are very well dated. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, what we hear from applicants and, and, and people around town is that they just, they just want to know what's next and what they need for every step. And so clarifying materials needed, clearing the drawing specificity needed, um, sort of the parameters and details of, the, of those at, at each step, defining what a, you know, a complete application is and having more of a stricter policy and procedure for putting cases on agendas. So things are, are coming to, to both the local committee, but also the full commission, um, you know, very well prepared. And, and we'd like to hold kind of a more strict regulation around that. Next slide, please. And then um, I think this is one that we we've talked about kind of loosely before has been feedback before, but um, in in the cases of design review committees that are in the same week as planning commission or landmarks commission, we wouldn't then kick them to that Friday or Thursday meeting immediately. So there's not going to be like a 48 hour period between, you know, the first conceptual review and then the conceptual review at planning commission. We want to give kind of a a week or, or I think it would be um, time-wise at least a, a nine-day buffer in between meetings. So, uh, you know, a conceptual review at the local committee and then the next conceptual review at the full planning commission, for example, would be, you know, nine days or, or two weeks later. So that they can, they can take some of those recommendations initially from the local committee and incorporate them into the next presentation rather than saying, you know, showing up at, at the commission saying, okay, we presented this two days earlier. Here's the feedback. We haven't done any of it yet, but here's what they told us, right? So I think it's a little bit um, more of a kind of defining like the workflow process. And and if we make this upfront to applicants, I think they'll, they'll very much appreciate, you know, these are, this is kind of your timeline moving forward. You can, you can bake that into the back end of your project for sure. Next slide. And then some of the long range updates. So all the all of what I talked about is kind of what we'd like to um, keep talking about over the next month or month or two and kind of incorporate early uh, early next year into our processes and procedures. And then some of these long range things that we're that we're looking to, to do is uh, update the applicants guide. There's an applicants guide on our website uh, for mostly for you know people who are dealing with our process for the first time or 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 out of town and are coming through to Cleveland. Um, uh, we'd like to update that. Um, we'd like to talk more about an integration with the landmarks and CPC process. So right now there's a few things that are that are kind of different for for both commissions that we'd like to um, align. And some of that requires some um, some legislation and kind of amendments to different ordinances. So that's something we'd like to talk about over time. Uh, and then a couple other things, we'd like to update the public art ordinance. Uh, Tara Petrus is on our staff is working on that. And then uh, I think based on staff size here uh, uh, and and what we have district wise around town, we'd like to probably look at consolidating some of the local landmarks commission or com committees around town. Um, they are, uh, it's, it's definitely like an administrative workload and, and burden for for our two staff members Carl Brenges and Jessica Beam uh, and so we'd like to kind of see where some of those districts could be consolidated and um, we had a little bit less uh, meetings and, and admin work on on that end uh, so that's about it um, happy to talk about anything in more detail and kind of certainly want to hear your feedback as well and, and some thoughts on this I'm sorry, it's muted. Uh, nice job, Adam. Um, you all have any uh, comments or questions concerning Adam's presentation? That that was that's chock full of information as well. <laughs> well, I, I'll make no, a I, comment. All right, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I'll just. Uh, ju I was just going to say I appreciate the, the the focus on making things a little more efficient and predictable. I think that's a criticism that we've gotten from projects and just not understanding. It's not the burden of going through the process. It's the confusion of going through the process sometimes. Um, and then I also know, and, um, and this is a little tangential, but uh, uh, still 
similar, I think. I, I know that Director Wong has been uh, kind of signing off on some things more administratively that maybe in the past would have gone through the full commission. And, and I think that it's it's useful to uh, not have to bring every small thing uh, before the commission because it makes our agendas long and it, it delays issuing permits. So, yeah, I think we'd like to, you know, it's kind of set some new thresholds for that over time too, right? So, like, um, you know, um, in in your ward, the the mosque landscaping plan didn't come back to the final commission, right? It went to the local committee and then it was administratively signed off on. And I think that makes total sense for a lot of these different projects around town. Um, so maybe defining some sort of scale threshold to to come before the commission is probably a good thing. That's a good point, Commissioner Slife. I I wholeheartedly we need to look at where we spend our time, right? And, and more importantly, I mean, the the objective is to look at things more globally on this commission. We're a planning commission. It's the operative word, in my opinion. And not get bogged down with those those small or details and minutia. Um, one thing you you know, Adam, I love process. <laughs> so um, because you know me, you create the framework and you manage expectations. Um, so I, I like the the notion of of continuing education, even for even for the planning commission. I mean that muscle memory needs to be worked continuously. So I see the commissioner Anthony's hand is up. Go ahead, commissioner. Thank you, Vice Chair Fluker and Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, another great presentation. Um, one consideration, and, and you elevated just the general updates around technological advancements for the city. Um, I really love the the training and having the videos on the website. I think that's a great idea for for folks to access. Um, and and you know, I think another suggestion would be you know explainer videos. You know, I think we're seeing more of this uh, from an accessibility standpoint, um, understanding the diversity of our city. Um, um, you know, as the changes are being made again, pending pending capacity and, and resources, um, short videos sometimes can you know allow people to process the information uh, if they have any sort of uh, disabilities or um, um, inabilities to read. Uh, I think is helpful as well. So thank you for for being cognizant of leveraging the technology. Uh, I would just add potentially if if capacity allows um, explainer videos. Yeah, we could we could definitely look into that. That's thank a great you. suggestion. Commissioner Anthony, very, very good point. Anything else from the commission? Well, I, I, I won't be premature. I think the director's report is next. <laughs> <laughs> Director Wong here, or are we going to hear from someone no, else? I'm going to uh, do the um, director's report in her place. Um, oh, okay. Okay, Marco, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, so. One, we want to thank Shannon for doing the townhouse code. I'm just going to reiterate that uh, it will be posted on the CPC website for 30 days for public comment. Staff will review the comments after the period ends and come back to the commission for any final discussion. With the commission's green light, we will move towards amending the code through the city council, uh, through with city council. Um, then there's a couple things under public engagement. Um, we completed our sixth and final fall engagement for the North Coast Lakefront Connector. Between 30 to 60 people showed per meeting and the overwhelming sentiment was to do something. No change was not an option and there will be meetings in the, in the spring to follow up. Um, yesterday, we held a hybrid Thrive 105 93 community meeting for the design phase of this essential east side north uh, south connector. Feedback was positive for creating multimodal options. Uh, the video will be posted on the Thrive 105.93 website um, until early January for anyone who wants to submit comments. Um, also, we are hiring um, right now. We have one posted position for our city planner, um, and we will post another uh, city planner position in mid-December. The one that we've had posted now uh, will close um, on December 15th. Um, so our next meeting, uh, director will give an end of year update and a North Coast Lakefront master plan update. Reminder that the commission will meet for lunch in person to welcome new members and do a refresher on various topics. We will take a minute, uh, take minutes and post them for our January meeting. 
and also 2023 schedules should be in your inboxes um, for the upcoming CPC meetings and Michael Bozak will send out um, the invites for that. That concludes the uh, report. Thank you, Marka. Um, I think this, this ends our meeting unless there's any other comments that one would like to make, but I just want to say one thing and I having been around City Hall for, for a better part of my career and worked there earlier on, I, I could feel the connectivity. I, I could feel the, the folks are enjoying themselves, which is good. You know, I know that, that we're all always at or above capacity, but it, it, it's good to know that, that, that you're supported and there's a, there's a path. So um, I appreciate you guys. Well, I guess we can adjourn the meeting, huh? Yes. All right, guys. See you in two weeks. All right. Take care. Take Bye. care. Take care, everyone. Thank you.